centric index under a 90. That's a big deal. I'll let Francine discuss a 136 pound sterling. And I really want to point out Canadian dollar. We've really ignored it. My fault. Looney ever stronger. Francine? Well, there's a lot going on, Tom. They're, of course, also keeping an eye on Swiss franc because of the U.S. labeling, labeling Switzerland a currency manipulator. Look, the pound, Tom, is climbing. Officials, officials are pretty cautious uh, predicting that a Brexit deal <clears throat> could come within days. Again, you know, differences remain. We're making progress. Frankly, it's difficult to read anything into that. Overall, European stocks are climbing as authorities are said to be expediting the rollout of a COVID vaccine. I think we had Ursula von der Leyen confirming that just moments Moments ago, Bitcoin. I know you talked about it, but I find that also significant, breaching 23,000 uh, briefly back at 22,566. Uh, and then look at euro level, Tom. We're 122.31, and you really wonder when it becomes problematic for ECB. Well, the weather comes in here, Francine. I know there's been some sporting weather over the recent years in Europe and in the United Kingdom. It has really been remarkably mild compared to olden times, it seems, on the East Coast. Not so with a large storm. Call it from Washington, the Poconos, the eastern part of Pennsylvania hammered, and then up to New England as well. Let's see what Hartford and Boston get uh, early in this morning and through, say, to 12 noon. Jim Romer is a meteorologist even better with best weather. He writes a wonderful newsletter folding weather into the commodity space, and we're thrilled that Jim Romer could join us this morning. Jim, are the winters now like the winters of our childhood? Absolutely not. Um, this is uh, this storm today, you know, obviously a little bit unusual, but, uh, you know, it's been a few years. We we're overdue for a snowstorm, but uh, winters are much warmer, certainly, than they were 30 to 50 years ago, the planet's warming. Look at the active hurricane season. I mean, they're all more intense because, in my view, definitely because of climate change. But, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see a much colder winter this year than we had certainly last year, though. Joseph, you're predicting a colder winter. What is the why of a colder winter? It's going to be variable. Actually, all our research, we have a La Nina, a cool ocean current in the Pacific, suggests that March actually could be the coldest and snowiest in parts of the uh, Northeast and Upper Midwest. I expect a, a Christmas snowstorm, too, in parts of upstate New York, New England, maybe a foot of snow. Uh, this is due to the Arctic, uh, actually, uh, some changes over the Arctic and also uh, La, La Nina. Jim, what's it changed? You know, what's changed the most whilst covering some of these storms? over the last couple of years? I know they change in temperature and severity, but have companies and people been able to adapt better to them? Um, you know, certainly there's a lot more uh, technology out there that lets people prepare, you know, days and weeks in advance for these events. I actually saw this about a week to 10 days ago, and I, again, I see another one over Christmas. So there's more than enough time to prepare for these. But what has really changed, you know, the oceans are so much warmer than they were 10, 20 years ago. That feeds these storms, increases water vapor, and creates these explosive hurricanes, which just go from a, a one to a category five just in a matter of hours. And also the snowstorms tend to have a lot more moisture with them when they do fall. Um, this past decade, uh, and I believe partly because of climate change for sure, we saw 27 major nor'easters. That is three to four times more than any time in the last five decades. So I think uh, you have to really pay attention to what's going on with the warming planet for sure. Um, Jim, I was reading this actually a quite amazing story saying, you know, how Russia will win the, the climate crisis just because there will be human, enormous human migrations that will transform agriculture and remake the world order. And the way that Russia is with, you know, its expansion towards Mongolia could actually win that. How will that change the U.S.? Have a change. Well, we have to be influenced by what's going on around other parts of the world. I mean, the Chinese also are making incredible efforts to go zero carbon by 2050. Look at what they're doing with electric cars. NIA, NIO, uh, looks up like 2,000 percent. That's going to be competing with Tesla because uh, the Russians and the Chinese, they all realize we have to have a greener planet. And I certainly hope our next administration takes this much more seriously and goes in that direction. Jim Romer. Thank you so much. It's been too long. Look forward to getting you back on with some of the commodity trends that we see, uh, certainly with the uh, best weather uh, in, in his business there with his newsletter, Weather uh, Watch. Futures, well, they advance up 22. Dow futures up 142. Coming up, David Rosenberg with us in moments. Lots to talk about with Mr. Rosenberg. Kathy Hochul will join from the Empire State, the lieutenant governor. 
on this horrific pandemic. Please stay with us. This is Bloomberg. the trends, investments, and competition of the European ETF industry. Join us on Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. With a new administration coming to Washington, changes are undoubtedly in store, from the economy to foreign policy to public health. I'm David Weston. Join me for a Balance of Power special report, a look ahead to the next four years, this weekend on Bloomberg Television. Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. Widely anticipated by Francine Lacroix and Tom Keene is always a conversation with David Rosenberg. I'll be blunt. He slices and dices inflation trends better than anyone I know. Rosenberg Research uh, in Toronto, among other places. David, wonderful to have you with us. I want to get right to the ramifications of a weak dollar. You're living it in Toronto with strong, strong Canada. It's a 6.3 fitted standard deviation move. Move. That's a big move. When does Mr. Trudeau scream? Well, I'm not so sure that uh, it's going to be the Prime Minister that says anything about the currency. Uh, but in the last uh, couple of days, uh, we did hear from the Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem, who for the first time actually expressed uh, concern uh, over the Canadian dollar strength, yeah. uh, you know, vis a vis the U.S. dollar. So that's, uh, and you've seen actually, out of all the currencies, that have not appreciated against the greenback in the past 24 hours. It's been the loony. So it is starting to resonate. You know, it's starting to resonate, and part of it is Chairman Powell is resonating uh, yesterday. The foreign exchange is a litmus paper of the system, but all of this goes back to yield and its linkage to inflation. What is your inflation call? Well, you know, you'd ordinarily think that, you know, a weaker U.S. dollar uh, would translate into inflation in the United States. And uh, that impulse is going to happen through the, the product market or the goods market. Um, but that's only a fraction of the CPI or the core CPI. It's really driven by services. So uh, the weak U.S. dollar is not going to have a major impact uh, on U.S. inflation when wage trends are likely to be moving lower because there's going to be still this idle capacity in the labor market. And the dominating feature in the CPI data in the United States, and this is the quirk, is that it's dominated by imputed rent and, uh, and residential rent. That's the primary force. And when you're looking at you know, vacancy rates in the uh, multi-unit sector, heading to, uh, heading to cycle highs and rental rates going down, uh, you're going to have this unusual situation where the dollar can weaken and inflation can still go down, primarily because of what's happening on the service sector side via the, the, the rent situation. 
But uh, David, how much is this problematic for other countries? So, you know, Tom started talking about the, the Canadian loony. We could also talk about Euro. Like, at what point can the ECB not handle Euro strength? Well, you know, everybody keeps on waiting for uh, the ECB to say something on the currency. Uh, and uh, who knows when that's going to happen. Uh, I mean, overnight, you know, we heard from uh, uh, the, uh, the finance minister in New Zealand, uh, who actually openly said, uh, we're not concerned about the stronger Kiwi. Uh, and that's taken uh, their currency up a few more notches. So it's really unclear. You know, it's a double-edged sword. Um, because what the weaker U.S. dollar does is it breathes liquidity into the global financial system. Uh, and so that's why, you know, you wake up every single day, the first thing you want to do is look at the chart of the DXY. If the U.S. dollar is down, you can bet your bottom dollar, uh, sorry the pun, uh, that um, global equities are going to firm up. So the bottom line yeah. here is that uh, it's really unclear. Look, I'll tell you this much. You look at the chart of the DXY, uh, you know, right now it's, uh, you know, it's uh, broken below 90. Uh, there's just dead air. If we break below the 2018 low of 88, there's right. dead air on the start all the way down to okay. 80. So it can go down. The U.S. dollar can go down another 10% from here. Okay, David Rosenberg and I are going to have a pro call right now. We're going to do some Greek letters. David, DXY on a log Y-axis has massive gamma. Why is DXY accelerating log convex right now? Well, I think that uh, to a very large extent here, it's a reflection uh, of uh, where the markets are pricing in monetary policy. So you've got a situation where Powell comes out and says that even if the economy strengthens, uh, we get the full employment price stability, they're not raising rates um, till at least uh, the end of 2023. Um, I don't think you have many other central banks <clears throat> that have their forward curve um, you know, so depressed in terms of where monetary policy expectations are. I mean, we just had, for example, the Norge Bank uh, in Norway just announced today at their meeting uh, that they're going to plan to nudge interest rates higher sometime in the first half of 2022, which is a full 18 months before the Fed's going to do anything. So I think a lot of this, notwithstanding the fact that monetary policy is so accommodative everywhere in the world, I think in terms of expectations, the only central bank telling you that they're going to have their foot on the pedal uh, for the next several years is the Federal Reserve. So I think it's that monetary policy expectation diversion that's really driven that wedge between where the U.S. dollar is going and most of the currencies in the world. Yeah, David, we also heard from PBOC that they could actually go at it alone and start tightening monetary policy. Now, this would be a divergence compared to everyone else um, around the world. What does that mean for dollar and renminbi? Well, I think it's pretty clear that in this particular case, uh, to sound glib, the trend is going to be your friend. Uh, and I think that there are other, say, shall we say, geopolitical reasons why uh, China wants a stronger renminbi. Um, we have to keep in mind here that China is ca capturing a uh, global share of GDP, and that's going to continue for some time. And I can tell you right now, I am fielding, if I'm not fielding questions about Bitcoin, uh, I'm fielding questions about whether at some point the renminbi will actually replace the U.S. dollar as a reserve world <clears throat> currency. And the answer to both, uh, Tom will probably come in with, with a harsh Bitcoin question, but let me ask you about the reserve currency one. What happens to renminbi? Well, I think that, look, the, the path of least resistance is that the renminbi is going to continue to appreciate. Um, if there is something that is a flying the ointment in that view, is that China is right now on the precipice of having its economy deflate in terms of its CPI uh, at a time when its economy is about the strongest in the world. Um, but I think that there are other political considerations here by the Politburo that they want to uh, validate a stronger currency uh, for their own geopolitical um, goals uh, in the future. So my sense is that um, the renminbi is most likely going to continue uh, to strengthen against the U.S. dollar, notwithstanding the fact that their economy right. Uh, right now is on the precipice of deflating, notwithstanding how strong it is on the real side. Uh, David, I want you to weigh in on Bitcoin. Noir Robini was on the other day, absolutely scathing. We had Scott Minard of Guggenheim yesterday talking about the scarcity factor, the proxy to gold, and that Bitcoin would go now from 10 to 20 up to $400,000 per whatever the unit is of the unit. David Rosenberg on Bitcoin. Discuss. Well, uh, I'll just say that, uh, um, you, you know, you speak to most people that are asking me to put money in Bitcoin, 
Uh, they can't even tell you uh, who the person was that developed it or even how it's actually mined. Um, so it's just a classic um, follow the herd, extremely crowded trade. It's in a massive bubble. Uh, and um, everybody seems to believe that, you know, we're going to get to that 21 million cap uh, on the uh, supply constraint. But there's really nothing in the protocol to suggest that the supply of Bitcoin can't go up once we hit that limit. Um, the one thing we do know about gold is we know the supply curve of gold with certainty. We don't know the future supply curve of Bitcoin. People think they know, but they don't really know. Uh, so I would just say that, um, you know, it's a, uh, it, it's a massive bubble, uh, and uh, it's extremely difficult to value right. to any intrinsic okay. work on what Bitcoin should be worth. David, do governments, including Canada, have I'm established more conservative than the U.S. on with their monetary history? Do governments have a responsibility to burst the bubble, or do they wait for the market to do it? Uh, I don't think that uh, it's the government's responsibility uh, to burst any bubble. Um, but I think at some point you are going to find uh, more of a proliferation uh, of government-led uh, digital currencies that'll act as some form of competition. You know, part of the problem here, of course, is that you can argue that Bitcoin is somewhat related to the lack of faith in fiat currencies. Um, so it's a self-defeating prophecy. But uh, governments aren't there to burst any bubbles. And look, the thing about Bitcoin is the last time it behaved like this in such a speculative fervor, uh, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, you might have, um, you know, wealthy fund managers calling for higher Bitcoin prices uh, and are actually putting their own money behind it. The reality is that it, the, the chart just looks absolutely crazy right now. And the last time it undertook this degree of speculative yeah. fervor, which was in late 2017, it went on to have an 80 percent bear market. I mean, the thing about Bitcoin and the reason why it's not really a valid investment thesis is that it's okay. so bloody volatile. It's five times the volatility <clears throat> of gold. Okay, da times. David, what we got to do is sell some soap here and we're going to come back. David Rosenberg with us fired up this morning on a snowy day with Rosenberg Art Research. We'll come back and uh, talk about more financial topics and economic topics as well. Coming up later, Christopher Harvey, Wells Fargo, head of equity strategy. Is this a melt-up? You tell me. Futures up 21. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin, 22751 Francine, I think it's an entry point. Maybe. Remember your password. concern is climate change. We can see the global warming accelerating at the moment and the goals that we must hit are so are so ambitious. It's 1.5 degrees by, by 2050, being climate uh, climate neutral in terms of emissions by, by 2050. That's a huge challenge. We have to reduce emissions by 50%, 2030, 2040 again. Um, it's very, very ambitious and mobility plays such a crucial role in there.
thing is to do it in developed countries. Uh, I think we're going to get there by 2030, but then the rest of the world, and that's just as important. If you look at developing countries, emerging countries, that's where probably the biggest challenge uh, we are going to face to also deploy EVs there and, and, and make mobility greener in those countries. It's possible to move mobility forward fast enough to be able to do its part in this in this fundamental uh, threat that we're facing. Our generation's biggest problem: climate change is happening, and the world's most innovative solutions: transport, industry, uh, buildings, electricity, all of those things. Everything you need to know about our changing environment, the politics of global warming. We can and we will deal with climate change. In the fight against climate change, Bloomberg Green has you covered. Their CPG history, their experience, and really how we might be able to um, uh, combine together to really create this fantastic public company. And so uh, we kind of got into this back thing a little bit before it became such a hot method of going public. with the Bloomberg Business Flash. Shares of Societe Generale have fallen 45% this year. That's led to speculation the French bank could be a takeover target. But as chairman told Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix, that's not going to happen. I think consolidation has been uh, put uh, 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 forward for two or three years. Uh, and if, when this will happen, uh, I think Societe Generale will be a protagonist, not, uh, not to pray. He also says he sees the economy returning to normal soon. There is light at the end of the tunnel. There are a few months to, uh, uh, to transition towards uh, this uh, return to uh, more normal times. And we have to organize this in a way that uh, is uh, not too bumpy. But it's clear that if you shut down everything, then when you open, people want to get out. And, uh, and so there is a risk uh, of uh, stop and go. And the chairman also criticized the European Central Bank for imposing strict limits on bank dividends next year. And that is the Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Uh, thank you so much, Karina. Yeah, it was a pretty interesting conversation, actually, with Lorenzo Binismaghi. He's, of course, former ECB. And, Tom, he was uh, one of the uh, chairmen that was most vocal about uh, the fact that it would really cripple uh, the, uh, the way that European banks uh, could actually manage yeah. everything if they couldn't pay dividends. So he was pretty tight-lipped, uh, or he was very polite about the fact that the ECB now puts stringent conditions. But, of course, it's a story that will run and run. Coming up on Bloomberg Markets, Jeffrey Curry, Goldman Sachs, Global Head of Commodity Research. That's at 3.30 p.m. in London, 10.30 a.m. in New York.
market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. The substantial reopening of the economy led to a rapid rebound in activity, and real GDP rose at an annual rate of 33% in the third quarter. In recent months, however, the pace of improvement has moderated. A full economic recovery is unlikely until people are confident that it is safe to engage, re-engage in a broad range of activities. If progress toward our goals were to slow, the guidance would convey our intention to increase policy accommodation through a lower expected path of the federal funds rate and a higher expected path of the balance sheet. Our guidance for both interest rates and asset purchases uh, will keep monetary policy accommodative until our maximum employment and price stability goals are achieved, and that's a, that's a powerful message. As I have emphasized before, these are lending powers, not spending powers. The current economic downturn is the most severe of our lifetimes. It will take a while to get back to the levels of economic activity and employment that prevailed at the beginning of this year. And it may take continued support from both monetary and fiscal policy to achieve that. Well, that was the Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell speaking yesterday. Still with us, uh, David Rosenberg, Rosenberg Research Founder and Chief Economist. Uh, David, w what will it take to actually see inflation in the U.S.? Well, I think from a big picture standpoint, um, you know, what we have to see uh, are really two things. Uh, we have to see uh, money velocity uh, stop contracting, turn around. Uh, and then when it bumps against this rampant money supply growth, uh, we will get significant inflation, probably more than even what the Fed is talking about right now. I think that's further down the road. Uh, the other thing that you want to pay attention to, of course, is the uh, output gap, really the, the classic measure of excess capacity in the economy. Um, those are the two things you want to focus on. And um, I, I think inflation is not a near-term danger, but uh, I think, you know, past the next couple of years, uh, I think it could come back much more significantly than what uh, everybody's talking about right now. So, David, let's assume that inflation comes back in, you know, 12, 18 months. It comes back maybe with a vengeance in 18 months. Out of all the major central banks, who would have the hardest time hiking rates? Well, I think that's an easy one. Uh, I think it'll be the Fed um, because, uh, as far as I could see, the Fed is the only central bank and, of course, the most important central bank the only central bank that's really boxed itself in. Um, it, it is so hung on its guidance uh, that it's told the markets, uh, you know, that we could actually get to full employment, you know, now below 4%. Uh, we can actually get a bit above 2%, uh, you know, and we're not touching interest rates till beyond the end of 2023. Uh, so I think actually um, if inflation comes back more quickly than what the Fed's thinking, um, I think that that's where the credibility issue is going to come into question. David, you link in inflation, interest rates, economics into the stock market. I'll let you decide when the mother of all bull markets started, whether it was 1975, some say 1981, 82-ish, some say 2009. I'll let you decide. The, the path of that bull market has been the great missed call. It's been a double-digit return per year, maybe 9% per year to split hairs. What did we get wrong on the single-digit guesstimate? Well, look, uh, I'm not so sure that um, we had a uh, uh, necessarily a, a, a secular bull market start, uh, you know, in, in 1982 and then last all the way to uh, February of uh, 2020. Uh, we had plenty of significant pullbacks yep, along the fair. way. The Fair. Serious. I mean, to talk. I mean, look what the, the Nasdaq was down something like eighty percent. Uh, you know, in the early two thousands, we had a sixty percent uh, bear market coming out of the great financial crisis. So I have a tough time wrapping my head around that. I think that the the the, the you know the really the it, when you look back, it wasn't that much of a surprise that we had that m massive cyclical bull market coming out of the great financial crisis because once they basically bailed out and recapitalized the banks. Um, you know, the, the, the game was over and time to move on. Um, really, the big surprise is the extent of the rally um, this time around. I, I mean, we have basically lost uh, almost three years of earnings growth with this pandemic. Uh, and when you're taking a look at the consensus views on earnings back as early as 2019 to 2022, um, you know, we haven't even played catch-up to that yet. And, and here the market since that time has roared ahead 
um, by more than 40 percent. And we've seen, of course, what's happened so far this year. Uh, look, it's, it, what makes this more difficult is when you have $18 trillion of global bonds trading negatively, uh, a third of the world bond market trades either zero or lower. So you know, how do you do any, any uh, you know, DCF analysis on equities when you have right. the, the equity risk premium is zero? And that's when people say to you, well, the multiples can just go to infinity. Look what Bob Schiller said the other day, defending a 33 multiple um, on his own index. Oh, boy. Well, because of look where uh, real rates are negative. Uh, nobody says, well, why are real rates negative to begin with? Maybe that says something about the economic outlook, but it just shows you the power of the multiple expansion uh, in this suppressed interest rate environment. And that's really what it comes down to. There's nothing really economic fundamental about this. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't even say it's necessarily just about the vaccines. I mean, that's added a cherry okay. on the cake. But, then but the market you- was... Market was surging before the vaccine, on the back of what the Fed Fair. did back in March. So, but, look, when you tell the markets that we're going to actually have the discount rate, okay, which is really the corporate interest rate, gravitate towards um, the risk-free rate, uh, you know, which is zero. You basically done what, Tom? You've eliminated. You've eliminated the equity risk premium, and that's a story for the equity market. Okay, but David, what are, you, what are you telling Rosenberg Research clients about this setup five years out? Do we get five years out with stability, or do we get five years out with massive instability as we readjust and recalibrate the equity risk premium? Well, let's just say that, firstly, everybody gauges you on your view on the S&P 500. It's one index. It's one market. Uh, there are uh, other pockets of the world where valuations are far less extreme. And so I've been saying uh, for the past number of months uh, to um, to start shifting towards uh, uh, East Asia, where actually growth prospects are, are, are much stronger, where interest rates are actually, for the most part, above zero, and where their equity valuations are much more appealing. So I've been saying uh, go East, young man and young woman, and start allocating geographically towards uh, towards the Asian market. Um, I would say on top of that, um, equities, look, there's some people have to be long-only equities. Uh, and uh, I've been saying for a while that we're going to come out of this pandemic and uh, we're all focused on the light at the end of the tunnel. We have a value trade on. It's not a value trend. But if you have to be in equities, uh, we're going to be in a period, the same period of elevated personal savings rates coming out of this. So you want to focus on what people need, not what they want. So I've been recommending to screen every- Every company you own uh, in terms of their utility or essential-like characteristics. That could be big tech, by the way, big staples, big pharma. Um, But on top of that, I think alternative investments are looking very attractive. And I'm talking specifically about not financial assets. Financial assets uh, are basically just in orbit uh, and uh, stratospheric uh, valuations. And expected returns actually should be either flat or negative. I firmly Mm -hmm. agree with uh, Jeremy Grantham when he talks about that. So I've been advocating a shift towards hard assets, tangible assets that stream off a recurring and reliable income stream. So, for example, um, you know, segments of real estate, uh, I'm not talking residential as much as perhaps industrial, uh, institutional. I think infrastructure globally is a great place to be in that context. Uh, and, um, and, and, and I've been very bullish, for example, if you're in the clean energy space and you believe in that, well, why wouldn't you be long natural gas, be long the pipelines, be long the hard assets, that will yeah. actually hold its value when we get to the inflationary scenario, but also stream off what's in scarcity value globally, which is yield or income. So I'm actually increasingly gravitating away from financial assets, which are tremendously expensive and totally reliant on interest rates staying at these levels to perpetuity, which we know is not going to happen. So focus increasingly now on hard assets, hard assets that stream off uh, a reliable income stream. That's what I would be doing. David, thank you so much. David Rosenberg there, Rosenberg Research Founder and Chief Economist, joining us this morning. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news in New York City. Here's Karina Mitchell. Hi, Karina. Francine, with the clock ticking, congressional leaders are still haggling over the final details of an almost $900 billion coronavirus stimulus package. Americans would get a one-time $600 payment, and there will also be $300 per week in supplement unemployment benefits and aid for small businesses. But Democrats will have to give up their demand for aid to state and local 
local governments, Republicans will drop their call for lawsuit liability protection. Bloomberg has learned that the White House is now holding urgent meetings to address that hacking link to Russia. The talks include officials from the FBI, National Intelligence, Homeland Security and the National Security Agency. A number of U.S. agencies were attacked by hackers believed to be tied to the Russian government. Over to Germany, a record increase in coronavirus infections there. Authorities reported more than 45,000 new cases today. That's over twice the number from the day before. Earlier this week, fatalities also set a daily record. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has hinted that a hard shutdown that just took effect will remain in force beyond January. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Karina Mitchell. This is Bloomberg. Fred Zee. Thank you so much, Karina. Now, coming up next, Oyston Olsen, the Norges Bank governor. We talk interest rates. We talk inflation. We talk debt. This is Bloomberg. good news in terms of vaccines and a chance to overcome the health crisis, but we are not there yet. We need the fiscal stimulus and we need it relatively quickly because I can see where the second wave is coming. You can see consumer spending beginning to get impacted again. What we need is we need surveillance to be stronger. Uh, we need uh, public health measures because you have no other way at the beginning. This is your best weapon and you need to use it well, the good news is that both the vaccines and the therapeutics, in particular the antibodies, are coming along and will start to bring that number way down. We don't just need more investment in public health. We must also rethink how we value health. I do believe a targeted fiscal stimulus is, is going to be in order to really begin a more equalized economy. surveillance Tom and Francine from London and New York Tom we continue of course uh, watching central banks and Norway central bank says it will probably be able to start raising rates earlier than previously signaled well investors now expect the Norges bank to be the first in the G10 currency sphere to start hiking with some expecting the move as early as next year well joining us is Oyston Olsen he's a governor of Norges bank governor Olsen thank you for joining us when you look at how Norway has actually dealt with the pandemic it's been dealt with much better than in many other countries. What exactly does that mean for monetary policy going forward? Well, let me first uh, underline that uh, <clears throat> that also, like that the world economy, our economy, the Norwegian economy, entered a uh, historically severe downturn uh, from March this year and onwards. And we're in, we're still into that situation. So, given the present outlook that we present today, it's still. We still need a very expansionary monetary policy uh, for more than one, say, one year, one year or so going looking forward. But then it's correct that if you compare our present, our today forecast for the policy rate with the path that we presented in September, <clears throat> it's the, the the first increase, the first cautious increase in the policy rate will take place. 
somewhat earlier in 2022 than we foresaw a few months ago. Uh, Governor Tom Keene uh, in New York, wonderful to have you with us again. Tell us about Norway and the weak dollar. The fact is there's been a decades-long strong dollar uh, against Krona. Uh, it's been absolutely remarkable to see. Finally, it rolls over a little more strong Norwegian Krona. Tell us your view of a weak U.S. dollar from November. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's hard, at least for me, to explain movements in, 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 in the biggest currency in the world, the dollar. Uh, it's, it's, it's a world currency. Uh, compared to that, the Norwegian corona is, is, is quite, it's quite, our economy is quite small. So the corona exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis dollar is a follower. It follows, so to say. But then there, there are some special features of our economy uh, which we could wait on and we seek to explain the corona developments. And that is the, the, the link to the oil and to the oil price. Uh, and the second factor which we which is there is, as a small open economy, uh, we're, we're not close to being a safe haven in the currency market. So we experience when, that when, when risk is, 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 is high and, and with great uncertainties uh, and development of that election in the, in the world economy, the corona has a uh, uh, tendency to weaken. And the opposite, when, when there are more positive news, for instance, as regards the access to a vaccine towards COVID-19. And, and I think, I think, continues to explain the, the, the more recent developments. The oil price have not come back, but it's, it's close, close yeah. to come up to, say, around $50. And uh, positive news to all of us, we now can foresee that an, a vaccine will be available in our country and in our neighboring countries early in, but, in 2021. Um, Governor, given the relative strength of the economy, how do you justify the weakness in the currency? Difficult to explain. <laughs> uh, let, let, if, I, if I go back, and you can, you, can, you can test that against our forecast, if I go back two or three years, uh, long before the pandemic hits, there were, there, we were on a good path uh, unemployment was very low, uh, prospects were positive, uh, and, and still we experienced that, and, we, and we, we, we forecasted in our case that we would see going forward a, a gradual uh, strengthening of the corona. That has been a typical pattern in our forecasts. Uh, while we have experienced the opposite, and I, I think the main explanation is the fact that Norway is a small open economy, the, the currency is affected by events all over the world, um, and it's in that, as I said, it's a follower currency. Yeah, and, and Governor, just, just to make sure I understand, earlier in the year, you basically reinstated the currency intervention tool. Are you still ready to use that, and do you worry about being labeled a currency manipulator if you do? Well, we, if, if, you, if you point to the, if the efforts uh, or the measures we took in, in March, we, as like many other countries, the central banks, we, we had our own liquidity measures. We provided the banks and the market with, 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 with massive amounts of, of krone. Um, and then we, for the first time since the late 1990s, we announced that we were ready as a bank and the longest bank was ready to, in, to intervene in the currency market. And, and we did that, but with very limited uh, uh, amounts. Uh, we haven't drawn back that announcement. We could do that if the circumstances came back, come back. But, but since March, April, luckily we have all experienced that we haven't the same turbulence in financial markets and, and not... And, and the same applies to the, the corona currency market, which now functions in more, more normal than it did in, in a few weeks, a yeah. couple of weeks in March. 
All right, thank you so much. Oyston Olsen there, the Norges Bank governor, joining us this morning. Now, from the Norges Bank to the Swiss National Bank, the central bank renewed its pledge to use currency interventions to counter any upward pressure or upward pressure on the franc just a day after being censored by the U.S. for the practice. The SNB president, Thomas Jordan, called the franc highly valued, and he spoke with Bloomberg's Catherine Bosley. Switzerland or the Swiss National Bank, we are not currency manipulators. Uh, we are looking forward to a constructive dialogue. We will explain again very clearly what are the reasons why we are not a currency manipulator. This is very important. And uh, if you look at the fact, I think it's very easy. If you take the nominal exchange rate uh, between the Swiss franc and the U.S. dollar, between the Swiss franc and the euro, you go back uh, 12 years at the beginning of the financial crisis, you see this enormous drop in the exchange rate. So the Swiss franc appreciated a lot. At the same time, we had almost all the time either zero or negative inflation. So this is a very different picture compared to one country or central bank that is actually manipulating its exchange rate. Why have you chosen the path of interventions and negative interest rates to address the economic situation? Why have you not chosen other measures? The United States, for example, in the report suggests, you know, domestic mm. QE, and then they talk about, you know, boosting the part labor market participation of women or boosts to productivity. Why have you chosen this particular path? Well, because it's the only one and the most effective that you have. Well, we had a huge appreci appreciation of the Swiss, fr Swiss franc in nominal terms. We had very low inflation, so we had to fight that. Without these interventions, Switzerland would have gone into an outright deflation with huge negative inflation rates, and we had to do that. So if you take the example of QE, we do not have a big uh, internal bond market, neither with government debt nor with uh, private debt. So this market is very small, it's illiquid, and so it gives not the same opportunity as the Fed has or the ECB. So the uh, interventions are really the only instruments that you have in order to massively increase the balance sheet and to fight the deflation in Switzerland. Well, that was the Swiss National Bank President, Thomas Jordan. Now, as we continue to track the virus, Bloomberg has also developed a unique partnership with the leading authority on COVID-19. Johns Hopkins has been at the forefront of the international response. And every day, we bring insight from experts in public health, infectious disease, and emergency preparedness. Joining us today is Jason Farley. He's Johns Hopkins nursing professor. Jason, we found out a couple of hours ago that Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, actually tested positive. He is the third leader of a G7 country to do so. Does that usually change public policy towards the virus? Did it change anything when President Trump got it? I think I was there, excuse me. So the short answer is no. In the United States, it actually um, emboldened people who said, oh, look, the virus is... Uh, not really serious. The president bounced back quickly and ultimately received uh, treatments that would not be available to the general public uh, in doing so. So it, it's hard to say. I think with Boris Johnson, we saw um, the public pay close attention, uh, particularly here in the United States. That caught everyone's attention. Uh, with Macron, uh, it will be interesting to see what the French people uh, feel after they see um, his recovery period. How are the vaccines doing in, in the U.S., Jason? So we had a, a couple of people actually reacting badly because of previous allergies or even because they didn't have any allergies. Does it make it less people or does it make it that less people will want to have a vaccine? Yeah, so we're in the public health community, we are very concerned about what we call vaccine hesitancy, meaning um, people being fearful of taking the vaccine. As I've spoken for before on this program, in full disclosure, I am a vaccine candidate participant in a research study. Um, but we are seeing, uh, we just saw a case of anaphylaxis or allergic reaction in Alaska among a healthcare worker who received the first dose of vaccine. But importantly, there are safety measures in place. We, we Once we give a dose of vaccine, we have the individual wait for at least 15 minutes to ensure that there is no anaphylaxis or allergic reaction. And if there is, we have clear protocols in place to address it. Importantly, we don't yet know exactly what component of the vaccine results in anaphylaxis. So the FDA recommended that individuals with a history of severe allergic reaction not receive the vaccine at this time. Jason, some of the figures that you sent through are absolutely shocking. Approximately one death in the U.S. every 36 seconds 
at the moment. Is this a new strain? There was talk, at least in the UK, that it, it could be a strain of something that's actually spreading quicker. Any truth in that? So there have been several analyses uh, and studies that have evaluated the mutation patterns of the virus. And all viruses, when they have this level of, of penetrance in the community or transmission, have some level of mutation. And there are a couple of genes that have demonstrated the potential for increased transmissibility. However, those same genes and the full genomic analysis of the virus have not shown increase in morbidity or mortality. So while there is some debate right now in the scientific community about whether or not these mutations are leading to potential super spreader events, they do not seem to be associated with greater morbidity or mortality at this time. Can families safely gather for the holidays? No. Um, we've seen from uh, the Thanksgiving holiday here in the United States um, uh, that uh, it has been a key driver of our increased cases uh, since that time, exactly as we predicted, 10 to 14 days after the holiday would be a huge surge uh, of cases. And we are seeing exactly what the epidemiologists predicted, uh, which is um, a huge uh, capacities um, not being able to meet the need and the, um, the load of patients at various sites. Here in Baltimore, we have opened our field hospital again and are needing to send patients from our emergency departments who don't seem like they need admission directly to our field hospital. Uh, so it is an extremely important issue, and I highly recommend all families uh, consider strongly not traveling and not visiting in uh, for the holidays. Jason, thank you so much. Jason Farley there of Johns Hopkins, and be sure to check out VRUS Go on the Bloomberg for the latest information. You can also tune in every day for our exclusive conversations with Johns Hopkins experts for an inside look at battling COVID-19. Now, there's a lot going on. As Tom would say, the news flow is absolutely terrific. We have Bank of England later on this afternoon. Uh, we look at jobs in the U.S. European stocks are actually climbing. A lot of authorities, and this was confirmed by uh, the Commission president, are saying that uh, the rollout of the COVID vaccine would begin before the end of the month. That would potentially give a boost to the region's battered economies. I'm also looking at pound climbing. Officials, once again, are cautiously predicting a Brexit deal within days. And then we look at Bitcoin breaching $23,000 for the first time. This is Bloomberg. Once it goes into this plant, it's heated up very quickly to 600 or so degrees. It basically carbonizes it, turns it into a carbon-rich material. Obviously, kills all of the um, all of the pathogens.
arguments to be made that perhaps we've gone up a little too far too fast. More money can potentially be put to work. I just don't really think it can continue in the pace that it has. The data is slowing, momentum is ebbing. You've seen those permanent layoffs increase. It's quite possible that you'll see numbers start to disappoint. A lot of this Band-Aid stimulus has already been priced in. The way people are spending, the timing of that spend has really shifted. Companies who have made it through 2020, when you get into 2021, something may just find it too difficult to keep going. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York and London, for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. A stormy New York City in this FX market. That's where the story is. Sound effects. Tom Keen. Fantastic. That's the sound of the dollar rolling over. <laughs> sound effects. It is. Give Joey me dollar. a break. The dollar DXY rolling over, yeah. the 90, Tom. You know, the dollar rolling over is front and center. I mean, John, what did you observe off of Chairman Powell? And, you know, you see the dollar really move. What is substantial progress? Apparently, it means exactly what it says. Can you picture that meeting? They go through the statement, they have a conversation afterwards, and they say, look, Jay, you know what the first question's going to be? They're going to ask you what substantial progress towards your goals actually are. Do you have an answer? Wait for this one, guys. He goes into the news conference, it's the first question, and what does he say? It means exactly what it says. Now, right now, Tom, that's not a problem. In six months' time, the well, market might <clears> define <throat> what it says for him. That's I, when it becomes an issue. I've been asking everybody, and as you know, John Farrow and Lisa Bramwich, you're going to get a straight answer from David Rosenberg. He just told us he heard the Canadian finance minister yesterday, the day before, finally start talking about strong loony. And the, the, the bottom line is you're going to hear this, John, from every single leader from Beijing around the world about this weak dollar. We're there right now. Euro dollar 122, cable 136. Lisa, that weakness is broad based in G10. Yeah, and that's actually leading to some concerns. Are we going to actually bottom out here? I will just say to your uh, imagined conversation, look, Jay, the first thing they're going to ask you, he actually did his job. Even though he disappointed market expectations for coming out and adjusting the bond purchases, he expressed that they're going to remain accommodative for the foreseeable future, and that's how markets moved. So I think that that's the question, and John, you raise a good point. Six months from now, what do we see and how do they communicate then? Meanwhile, what we're looking at in the here and now, 8.30 a.m., we're going to be getting U.S. initial jobless claims. Not so much looking for the exact number, which is 815,000. That's the expectation. But the trend line, last week we saw the biggest increase in initial jobless claims since September. Are we going to see that general increase as we see lockdowns increase and just people stay home because of the spreading pandemic? 9 a.m., I'm looking out for this. The FDA committee is meeting to discuss authorization for Moderna's COVID vaccine. This is very exciting. Uh, Moderna a little bit lower today uh, in pre-market trading, but people are hopeful. This vaccine, you don't have to refrigerate it at the incredibly low temperatures as Pfizer possibly making it easier to distribute. And today might be the day. We might be getting the text to that $900 billion uh, stimulus plan that we were talking about yesterday from congressional leaders. A lot of people are expecting $600 of direct payments to individuals, plus some additional payments um, continued for the unemployment benefits. Really interesting to see, John, whether they can actually push this across. <coughs> Markets are basically pricing it in as a given. We might get a deal down in D.C. Maybe. We've already got a chairman willing to buy the debt through the rest of 2021 and maybe beyond, Tom. To build on what Lisa said, I think it was really important to see the forecast go up and the trajectory for policy stay the same. Now, for some people, that's easing. In fact, for Neil Dutter of Renaissance Macro, that's exactly what it is. It's passive easing. <coughs> this is what they're trying to communicate. Right. Things might get better. We won't step in and ruin the party like we did last time. Oh, I, I totally agree with you. I like, the, I like the phrase passive easing a lot, John. Look at Bank of England and those headlines before we get to the, the equity market. And, you know, they say Bank of England says unusually uncertain. How much of the rest of the global economy is unusually uncertain? And I would suggest, John, you know, it's like the tots losing to Liverpool like they did yesterday. Things are unusually uncertain. That. Maybe that's what Chairman Powell was watching halfway through that news conference. He got distracted early on. Lisa Brown has given him way too much credit on that news conference. Really? Tom, look, 
the policy from the Fed is really, really clear. I just think when it comes to answering questions, this chairman well, is still a little bit all over the place, and he seemed very distracted at times, Lisa, but, when he should have been ready to give straight answers to very straightforward questions. I don't disagree, and yet markets did not freak out about it. We didn't see a taper tantrum. In fact, yields remained completely under control, even though, by all accounts, he disappointed on the headline in terms of actually changing policy, but actually gave more in terms of how accommodative they would remain. John, that's telling. He was not that clean, and yet still markets were disciplined. Yeah, I, that I agree with. I just don't think we should define the chairman's performance on where the market goes. There was a moment in that news conference yesterday when he brought up the sustainability of the debt down in Washington and the federal debt in the United States. And Tommy talked about real borrowing costs as a percentage of GDP, which is a really good way of saying that it's sustainable. But what's interesting about that is that's tacit admission that it's the Federal Reserve keeping borrowing yeah. costs and keeping the fiscal <clears throat> stance in the United States sustainable. They're boxing themselves in here, and I think that's a bit of a problem well, in the years to come. It's not a problem now. I just think it might be a problem in the future. Yeah, and I would say, John, French for boxing yourselves in is, is being overcome by events, and you wonder what those events could be in 2021. And, John, I know you know that on this show, one of those themes is weak dollar, what's it mean for everybody else, and the other is a certitude of higher interest rates. We will see. Our currency, your problem, apparently, exactly. for the moment, at least anyway. Here's the market action this morning, guys. This Thursday morning, we pick up in the equity market. We head towards all-time highs on the S&P 500, cleanly through 3,700, up 19, up another half of 1%. Euro dollar, 122.37, up one-third of 1%. And in the bond market, yields just inching a little bit higher. To Lisa's point, no drama here. A lot of people thought this might be the day of reckoning for Treasuries. It wasn't. Yields up by a basis point to 0 0.9246 percent. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say, Chris Harvey, Wells Fargo Securities Head of Equity Strategy. Momentum is too rich for our blood over at Wells Fargo. Chris, what does that mean? So what that means is, <clears throat> excuse me, momentum strategies have gone too far. Right. Everyone during the recession ran to momentum strategies. They bid them up to a level that I don't think is sustainable. And this setup is very much what we've seen in 2003, 2009. You have a recession. Everyone runs to the safety of momentum. They bid them up to a level that's not sustainable. Recovery comes around and PMs say, oh, I need to get cyclicality. They run for momentum. It becomes a contra indicator. And next thing you know, somebody says we have a 2000 Sigma event, which isn't true. We have a point of inflection, which is what happens with momentum strategies, because ultimately you make a deal with the devil. You, you buy momentum. It continues to go up. It performs. But when it turns, it turns right. very badly and you need to get out quickly. Chris, given the unusually uncertain in the United Kingdom and the United States and frankly everywhere else, what is your revenue and down the income statement call? What's your actual fundamental call on what the right. stock market will do? So our, our stock market call for 2021 is, is very pedestrian. We're looking at mid single digit returns. And what we've been saying to clients for some time is if you want high returns, if you want more competitive rates of returns, you need to look down the market capitalization, smaller caps, you need to add more cyclicality, higher COVID beta, and you need to start going into the financials. All right, so Chris, right now you say that you're anti-mo, no mo, you're not going to go with the momentum. The price of admission is too yeah. high. So what do you do with your money? So what you do is, it, it's very simple. The, the opposite of mo is contrarian. You're looking for opportunities that are less picked over. And again, I'm going to sound like a broken record. Obviously, small caps have worked and have worked for, for the last couple of weeks, last couple of months. But if you look at a multi-year basis, they've really underperformed. And we want to look for things that give you more value, things that, that will work in a early recovery, more cyclicality. And you can find that in financials. You can find that in industrials. You can even find that in, in the commodity space. So we want you to be diversified, but we want you to have these certain characteristics in your portfolio. Do you stand in the United States for that, Chris? Um, you go across the globe. So, so typically when value works, when cyclicality works, it works better overseas. Uh, U.S. is very growth heavy, is very tech heavy. So I think you can source that in a number of different places, including the states. But I think the rest of the world is going to act a lot better in 2021. Chris, if that's the case, where's the opportunity now? Or is it running away from us? I mean, some of these are moonshot trajectories right now. Right, which is why we say we're anti-mo. A lot of these companies have had these parabolic moves. There will be a day of reckoning. 
the value that you're paying, what the, the cost of admission is just too high. And ultimately, when you have an alternative, when the economy begins to recover, which is what it's doing, people will come back to cyclicality. They'll want the old economy and they'll run very quickly from it. But to answer your question, yes, every day we go higher, we feel like we're, we're stealing from tomorrow. Uh, there's a limited amount of opportunity here and it's getting less and less every day. And time out. You've been at home with the kids too long, Chris. <laughs> and time out. <laughs> We're I hanging out with Lisa. What's, I mean, all the glue could, right. could not be more right. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, great to catch up. Thanks for everything in 2020, sir. My best to you and the family. The Chris Harvey there of Wells Fargo. What is anti-mo? Anti-momentum. Anti Come on, it's a factor thing. You know, it's like oh, factors. That's not what it is. Oh, Tom, thanks. In, in this thanks for that, Tom. <laughs> I appreciate that. Look, look, I had a tough morning. Basim drives me. And, you know, the Bentley, the snow, John, the slush, the salt. Uh -huh. He shows up and he's got, you know, the big SUV <laughs> thing. It wasn't a Hummer, but it was ginormous. John, I got up wicked early to get here. I uh, got here in four life. minutes. Four minutes. I noticed because I got a message at 1 Eastern. Yeah, I exactly. at 1 Eastern. I know how long it would take to walk from yours to the office. Yeah. And it's not four hours. What was the, what was the email at 1 a.m.? So why did you get up at 1 Eastern? Because I started my Christmas shopping. I forget, shop, Lisa. Then it's like, some you know, nonsense painful. about the football about game the tots, yesterday of course. or something. I knew I mean, it. I've, I've, woken up, I've, I've woken up to lyrics from... Africa, the song, literally, just Toto. a couple of lines from it. Which All right, just... let's hear it. I, I don't Toto, know. you want me to sing no, it? We, no, we, we do we, that. We play I'm the song. We play, you need the rhythm. You need the song. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to get know. someone to play the okay, song. Wait, hold it's on the a second. anthem, Tom, Lisa. Yeah, I know. Tom, I have a question. How much of the Fed conference did you actually watch, and how much of the game, okay. how much of your tots getting crushed? Exactly. You look at her. Um, I watched about 70% of it and 30% of it. It was like Bed Wars. You know, I'm doing like the Bed Wars thing, watching the tots at Liverpool. You know, it's like, you know, I'm in school, virtual learning, and I'm doing Bed Wars on the side. Same thing. We're still on air. It's okay. Rich Miller opened up, and I could see he had tots on in the background. McKee closes with two strong questions. He's looking at Liverpool win. I know for a fact you were doing your expenses during the news conference because I've got, <laughs> got the same message right. to do mine. The dollar weaker, down six tenths of one percent for our audience worldwide. Good morning. Drinks at the same this region? is Bloomberg. Yeah, <laughs> <I was expected. laughs> With the first word news, I'm Karina Mitchell. Congressional leaders are close to an agreement on an almost $900 billion coronavirus aid package. The plan includes a one-time $600 payment for individuals. Plus, there will be $300 per week in supplemental unemployment insurance payments and aid for small business. What's not included? Aid to state and local governments and lawsuit liability protection. Meanwhile, Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell sees light at the end of the tunnel. After the Fed's last policymaking meeting of the year, Powell sounded the most optimistic he's been since the coronavirus pandemic began. At the same time, he pledged that the central bank will keep providing the economy with plenty of support well into the future. And France's President Emmanuel Macron has tested positive for COVID-19. The presidential palace says he took a test as soon as symptoms appeared, but it didn't say what those symptoms were. Macron will self-isolate for seven days and will continue to work. And the UK and the European Union are heading for a final battle over fishing rights. That's apparently the one major issue standing in the way of a post-Brexit trade deal. Officials are cautiously predicting an agreement within days. The focus on fish is a sign the two sides have largely settled their differences over another major issue, a level playing field for business. And Bitcoin has rallied roughly 20% this week and even touched 23,000 for the first time. Analysts say the digital currency still has room to run. Bitcoin and the larger Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index have both more than tripled this year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Karina Mitchell. This is Bloomberg.
Weston. Bluebird Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. interesting new world. The world is changing. For us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best. Well, everyone is zigging, we're zagging. We feel like we can maybe help people out more. We have an enormous number of big ideas. What we're trying to accomplish at Bumble is that you can drive profit and purpose. And they can coincide, they can coexist. And in fact, they fuel one another. I think what we've seen during this period of time is that communicating via video is not a fad. That we are using it in all aspects of our lives for work, for learning, for communicating, for staying in touch. The Democratic leader and I worked into the evening alongside the Speaker of the House and the House Republican leader. We made major headway toward hammering out a targeted pandemic relief package that would be able to pass both chambers with bipartisan majorities. We are getting closer down in Washington, D.C. That was Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader, the Republican from Kentucky. For our audience worldwide this morning, good morning. Alongside Lisa Abramitz and Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Here's the price action this Thursday morning. Jobless claims about one hour and 12 minutes away. The data has been heading in the wrong direction yeah. in America over the last couple of weeks. In the bond market, yields up by about a basis point to 0.9246%. More broadly, in G10, some of these crosses going back to spring 2018, which was the bottom of dollar weakness out of the happy talk and synchronized global growth of 2017. Euro is one of those currency pairs against the dollar. Euro dollar 122.38. A 122 handle on the euro, a 136 handle on cable. In the equity market, up another five tenths of 1% here, Tom. Up around about 19 points on the S&P 500. We might see a record high at some point later today off the back of some of the talk down in D.C. No question about that. The VIX popped in off the Powell presser from 23-ish to 22. We really haven't seen that big move yet. 22.05 on the VIX. Let's get right to it. Kevin Cirilli front and center. And Kevin, I, I think the news flow is so extraordinary. It's real simple. What will you look for in the next eight hours? Stimulus. And in terms of the bottom line, what specifically in the stimulus? You've got to try to get inside of the mind of the negotiators of this bill. For Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, even if liability protections are not in this go around, he understands that this is not his final whack at the issue of liability protections. He's going to have what he feels and Republicans feel, I'm told, is more leverage in the next round of economic stimulus negotiations when President elect. Joe Biden is sworn in because this, and this is the big if, if he is able to maintain control of the Senate in Georgia. I was struck by the headline across the Bloomberg terminal yesterday in which Leader McConnell reportedly told uh, a group of Republican lawmakers that he believes fiscal stimulus will help Senators Perdue and Leffler in their respective runoff races in January. What is the gaming on that Senate race? I mean, I really want to talk stimulus, but you're link linking it directly in. There's two races. Could they both go Democratic? 
They could. It's a, it's it's definitely a, obviously an outcome that's on the table. But in terms of the what yesterday's reporting suggests is that this is the first time, the first time Senate leadership and the Republican side has brought up the issue of Georgia uh, in in their mm -hmm. negotiations. Uh, uh, and, and I bring this up because this is a clear difference from the calculation that Leader McConnell and his orbit had made in the run up to the presidential and, and down ballot race elections in November uh, because they felt that this was a separate issue. They don't feel that way this go around. That's the message for Georgia. Let's talk about the message to New York, to California. In about 25 minutes, we'll catch up with the Lieutenant Governor of New York, Kathy Hochul. And she's been asking repeatedly every time she comes on this program that we need state aid. Kevin, they're not going to get it anytime soon. What is Democratic leadership telling them? They're not going to get it, but they are going to likely receive funds for vaccination distribution. Uh, the Democrats, dependent upon their geographics, are essentially telling them they will have another opportunity uh, in February or March once President-elect Biden is sworn in. The issue for state and local officials across the country now becomes a localized issue in terms of the vaccination distribution models. Will state governments, will people like the lieutenant governor, Governor, will they be able to deploy, for example, the National Guard, as Governor Hogan, a Republican from Maryland, did uh, earlier this week in assisting with the rollout of the vaccine? It's a state issue. It's one that Republicans are going to be carefully monitoring, as well as Democrats. Democrats are saying they need more assistance financially on that standpoint, but likely, as you just mentioned, they aren't going to receive it by the end of the week. Kevin, it's also a messaging issue. And Mike Pence, I know, has come out and said that he's going to publicly get the vaccine, as is Joe Biden, president-elect. President Trump has demurred, said he is not going to get it so far, but will decide when to. Is there any word on his plans with vaccination and the public uh, campaign to just get people confident in this inoculation? Well, political titles aside, it's important to note that the president has uh, had uh, contracted and, and beat COVID-19. And so if an individual uh, does that, they have to obviously consult uh, with their own medical personnel in terms of whether or not they should be receiving the, the vaccines. They have to go through their doctor, through their process. From what we know, we don't uh, know that the, that the vice president uh, or the president-elect, uh, they have all tested negative for, for this virus. I bring this up because... Yesterday, President-elect Joe Biden, who has been receiving series of questions uh, from reporters <clears throat> traveling with him, uh, had said that he is going to get the vaccine publicly next week. And next week, uh, uh, obviously, a, a significant holiday uh, and uh, around Christmas. Uh, and that imagery could be incredibly right. powerful for a president-elect around Christmas to get a vaccine uh, just a few weeks before he's sworn into office. Kevin, the people you talk to every day are going to go home what are they going to hear from their constituents? Frustration, um, a, a lack of uh, frustration, patience running out, uh, and, 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 and an understanding that something significant uh, has to significantly change, dependent upon what parts of the country they go home to. The suburbs are very different right now uh, than what's happening in, uh, in districts that are more representative of cities, uh, which are in dire need of economic assistance in the sense of economic stimul stimulation and revitalization. But more rural parts of the country, there's, there's a reckoning that's about to occur in the next two years uh, in terms of the Republican Party and the idea of reining in uh, spending. Uh, and that debate is about to be had. Uh, I, would, I would argue that it'll, it'll start to be had uh, in the next round of stimulus talks. But first, let's get through this one. So, Kevin, this might be it. Once this is passed, this might be it. Some people feel that way, that after January 5th, after January 20th, nothing's getting done for two years. I, I, in terms of economic revitalization and, and a significant round of trillion dollar worth of stimulus, uh, it, it's a big unknown. Uh, the, it, whether or not President-elect Biden can package another round of stimulus through the prism of national security, through the prism of protecting, protecting domestic and international digital infrastructure remains to be seen. Typically, in the first 100 days, if you go back to Roosevelt, for example, the, the, the new president has an opportunity to really uh, come out swinging. The, the biggest conversation that's being had in Washington amongst the more uh, think tank communities is whether or not 
uh, President-elect Biden's geopolitical plans will actually, in the first 100 days, be more significant than his ability to pass through meaningful yeah. package uh, uh, with, a di with a divided government. But that's still unknown because of Georgia. Executive power. Very yeah. strong. We've seen that over the last term. Kevin, thank you, sir. As always, thank you. Bloomberg Chief Washington Correspondent down in D.C., Tom Keane, just inching a little bit closer. There's a real feeling now that this isn't just optics, this is substance. We're getting somewhere. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And we're getting somewhere because of December 26. I mean, there's nothing like jobs, jobs, jobs is the foundation of all politics. And that's the key date for millions of Americans. And I'm sorry, December 26 is like tomorrow. We'll talk about jobs one hour from now. We'll preview that with Tom Porcelli of RBC. For our audience worldwide, good morning. This is Bloomberg. some good news in terms of vaccines and a chance to overcome the health crisis, but we are not there yet. We need the fiscal stimulus. We need it relatively quickly because I can see where the second wave is coming. You can see consumer spending beginning to get impacted again. What we need is we need surveillance to be stronger. Uh, we need uh, public health measures because you have no other way at the beginning. This is your best weapon and you need to use it well. The good news is that both the vaccines and the therapeutics, in particular the antibodies, are coming along and will start to bring that number way down. We don't just need more investment in public health. We must also rethink how we value health. I do believe a targeted fiscal stimulus is, is going to be in order to really begin a more equalized economy. Our generation's biggest problem. Climate change is happening. And the world's most innovative solutions. Transport, industry, uh, buildings, electricity, all of those things. Everything you need to know about our changing environment. The politics of global warming. We can and we will deal with climate change. In the fight against climate change, Bloomberg Green has you covered. I'm David Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. Just getting comfortable thinking about Tom Keane walking home in the snow. A little bit later, that'll be good, won't it? From New York and London, 
for our audience worldwide. Good morning to you all. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Here's the price action. 37.12 is your intraday record high on the S&P 500. Futures this morning advancing nicely, up another half of 1% on S&P 500 futures. We advance 18 points or so. That's the equity market. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Really powerful message from the Federal Reserve. Not in the news conference, just in the statement and the projections. The outlook's clear. They think it's going to get better than they thought it was at the last meeting when they had the projections, and yet policy will stay the same. That's a powerful message to come from any central bank, and that's the message the Fed is trying to send. If things improve, we won't ruin the party, we won't step back in. What is substantial progress towards our goals? They won't define that right now. You're not interested in defining it at the moment either. But maybe in the middle of the next year, that will change. And maybe that's when we've got a bit of a problem for this bond market. At the moment, yields well behaved. 0.92% on a US 10-year. 60 minutes from now, jobless claims. And claims have been moving in the wrong direction over the last couple of weeks. Let's finish on this in foreign exchange. The dollar index, DXY, weighted about 57% towards the euro. You could take a pick at the Bloomberg dollar index, weighted against the euro by about... 33%, more broadly weighted, same story, dollar weaker, intraday, down six tenths of 1% on the DXY, Tom, sub 90, and the story's clear, broad-based dollar weaker, and a Federal Reserve that's not stepping back in, even if that economy gets better, back in 21. Not in the zeitgeist, John, yen with a 102 print, a lower number is a stronger Japanese yen, 104, 103 through to a 102 earlier today, right now 10304 through 100 there would be a huge deal. I can't say I've never done this, but I don't think I've ever done this. We just talk about a jobs day, 20, 21 days ahead of schedule. It's a late jobs day, January 8. Tom Purcelli joins with RBC Capital Markets. Tom, frame up that key January 8 report. How grim is it going to be? Yeah, I mean, look, it's still a little early, but uh, we, we are acknowledging that you could see another decline um, uh, in, in uh, for that December report. Uh, you just haven't seen a lot of real improvement uh, in, in uh, continuing claims. Obviously, we've seen um, initial claims uh, rise a bit, but it's, it's the continuing part that's really going to feed most uh, uh, into the you know sort of what our what our call is going to be as it relates to the payroll report. So yeah, I think I think you're, look, it's not just this December report. I mean, I think the, the reality is um, if states continue to shut down, then uh, you're going to see um, uh, perhaps even the January report, uh, uh, the, the report for January, come in come in negative. So I, I think we're going to go through a rough patch. Now, look, let me be clear, um, and I'm happy to talk about sort of the near term uh, as as much as you like. But uh, while we're going to go through this rough patch here. We have to recognize that 21 is shaping up to be a, a, a pretty good year. Uh, you know, all the or I should say it this way, all the pieces are in place for 21 to be a pretty good year. What does Q2, Q3 look like? When does the service sector go back to work based on RBC research? Yeah, so we, oh, as my daughter rolls through the shot, apologies. that's okay. <laughs> you gave her 10, Tom, you gave her $10. I, yeah, when you, home. Did you give her $10 to shovel the driveway this morning? Tom, you got to go bigger. You got to go $20. Welcome to 2020. Tom, $20. You got to go $20. They won't shovel it for anything under that. Yeah. Um, and, and now I see through the corner of my eye, my dog is about to walk through as well. Um, we love it. So, um, I, I think the question was uh, about when do we get back to, uh, um, uh, to gaining jobs? And look, I, I think the reality is we, we could be gaining jobs, um, uh, you know, sort of shortly into the into the new year. You know, it was funny, Tom. I, I think one of the things that I think is being really underappreciated is think about um, some of the recent reports that we got from the NFIB or from ISM or even the Beige Book, they were talking about labor tightness. I mean, think about that. They were talking about labor tightness amidst all of this. So I think what winds up happening is as we continue into the year, as states start the process of reopening again, we think you could easily be back down toward full employment by the middle of the year. I mean, I, I think that that's a foregone conclusion from our perspective. The, I think the bigger question is, you know, how much progress do we make uh, over the balance of the year beyond beyond uh, uh, the middle of the year? So uh, you could be below full employment by, by the end of 21.
Tom, I feel like we're part of your family. It's really lovely, I've got to say. And you're doing a great job just plowing through with all the distractions in the background that you clearly see uh, in the back yeah. of your eye. I do wonder, uh, you know, a lot of people discount some of the data that we're getting, saying it's messy, it's noisy, it's complicated because the numbers are so big and the reporting from states has been yeah. called into question. But there has been a transformation in the labor force to a more technological society. And I was looking today at a story that talked about Amazon warehouse workers and how they are paid uh, pretty low wages and a great number of them have to receive food stamps. What are we going to see on the other side of this pandemic in terms of the transformation and the, and the ability for people to get middle income jobs on the other side? Yeah, so look, I think, again, the, the job openings report is going to be pretty instructive in this regard. And I think what we have to keep in mind is we have almost 7 million job openings. Um, and, and they're fairly broad-based. I mean, again, look, when you look at the ISM report, you know, the ISM report, they're not necessarily talking about high, you know, uh, lack of, uh, of ability to hire for, you know, ultra, um, you know, high-level executive jobs. I mean, they're they're looking for people on basically, uh, you know, sort of um, in, in the manufacturing space. Um, and they're having a hard time finding uh, workers in, in that capacity. So there are jobs out there. I think it's just going to take time for, for this healing process to, to, to continue. Um, but I, I think by the time, again, I think next year at this time, um, you know, let, let, let's promise to have another conversation on December 17th, assuming that's not a weekend. Um, and I, I think well, the story will be very, very different. I, I think that it's, you are going to be below full employment by that point next year. We'll be talking about how hot the Fed's running it, Tom, you think, in nine months? I, I, I do, Jonathan. I, I think that, you know, the, again, here, too, we think the conversation is going to change pretty abruptly. I mean, <clears throat> I've said many times, uh, I think even to you all, that, I, you know, Powell is not incentivized to talk positively about the economic backdrop, right? He's he's more incentivized to, you know, say, hey, we're, 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 we're cautious, we're ready to do what we can, and et cetera. But I think... There's going to have to be at some point a pivot over the course of 21 where we move from this, hey, things are you know sort of looking really bad to, hey, actually, things are looking pretty good and we're actually starting to see some inflationary pressures really start to build. We wouldn't be the least bit surprised if the Fed moves away from this notion of, you know, hey, we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to raise rates until 23 or beyond. Um, we can easily make an argument that you could see a rate hike in, in 22. Now, before anyone falls out of their chair, I, I think what people have to keep in mind is, we're not talking about, you know, th there's a difference between hiking rates and actually having tight policy. The removal sure. of accommodation in and of itself doesn't mean that you have tight policy. It means that you're removing some accommodation. And so if the backdrop evolves as we think, which is to say, you know, 5% growth with upside risk, uh, uh, core inflation that's, you know, north of 2% and even touches 2.5% um, over the course of 21, I think it's going to be really difficult for the Fed to latch on to this notion that they're not going to do anything until 23. I mean, that, uh, you know, that, that to me is just entirely too far-fetched. Even Powell himself has acknowledged that things in the medium term, that there are upside risks in the medium term. Um, I, you know, that, that to us is he's, he's right to say that um, because we think that there are. Um, and in that context, there's going to be no scenario, again, short of things really collapsing again, that they're going to, uh, you know, not be able to touch rates until 23. And, and well, the word way, I think we're about to hear. Sure, go on. And I don't want to be mindful of time, but I think we have to keep in mind, I think everyone's looking for the steepener in, in, in 21. They are, um, yeah. I, I, look, and I'm sympathetic to the idea of a, a bit more steepening here in the immediate term. But I think as the year progresses, um, again, as you get toward the back end of the year, I can make the argument that the curve actually starts to flatten because I think the, the front end of the market will start to sniff out pretty early that the Fed is actually going to be late to the party. Um, and thus, I could see, uh, again, the curve is going to rise in general, but I see uh, two-year yields rising faster than tens. And I, you can actually see some curve flattening as the year progresses. So, Tom, let's build on this. Let's think about it a little bit more of the communication that we've had in the last 24 yeah. hours. Is the qualitative outcome-based guidance a feature or a bug, do you think? Uh, I, you know, so I, I love this question. Um, they want it to be a feature, but I think it's a bug. I mean, I think it's really hard. Look, the, the reality is we don't know. I, you know, Powell's asked, one of the reporters asked him a great question yesterday, and it was basically, and it was basically how do we know, you know, when, when, when we've sort of, when, when we've met your objectives? Um, you know, is the SEP a good, uh, the summary of economic projections, is that a good guidepost? 
And, and Merlo basically said, no, he's like, it's not a good guidepost because he doesn't know exactly what it is. And I'm sympathetic to that. But I think there's the problem with this, this you know, quote unquote, outcome based guidance. If we don't really know what output we're aiming for, then how do you know when you've arrived? Um, so I, I think this whole notion of, of, of shifting the framework, I, I think it's going to wind up proving to be quite messy for the Fed da down the road, particularly right. because we just don't have the guideposts in place. And again, I'm sort of sympathetic to them on some level, but on the other, I, you know, I don't know why mm -hmm. they had to actually go down this path, um, particularly if you're not going to set up the right guideposts. Tom, and, and we don't know what they are. Within your enthusiasm, do you just assume service sector inflation reverts to its 3 percentage mean? Yeah, Tom. So I, I think it, uh, we, we do. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that people, I think, are, are um, uh, you know, seem to forget is that we, we, we are, uh, um, from a, a service sector inflation perspective, it just persistently runs at around a 3% pace. Um, and guess where we have a lot of room to make up from a spending perspective in 21? Services, right? Goods have killed it. Uh, yeah. you know, they're well north of where we were pre-COVID. Services is the laggard. Um, and that's going to be the area that we really make okay. up for from a consumption so, so Tom, rise. if services are lagging, does that mean you pay $50 to your daughter to shovel the no. driveway? <laughs> Actually, that's why she just ran away. She, she's going right now to do that. <laughs> Hold it out for 60. <laughs> exactly. Who we really want to meet is young Preston Poor Sally, who I understand is up 45%. He's, he's unbelievable. He's up to date on the yeah, NASDAQ. Is he, is he around, he's Tom? It. He's crushed it this year. <laughs> he has. Tom was selling great to catch up, sir. From RBC. Send our regards to the family. Tom, thank you. <laughs> thank you know what I love about this year? There's only one thing I love about this year because this year's been terrible for so many reasons for everybody. How natural that's now become. Do you yeah. remember when they had yes. that interview yes. over in Hong Kong several yes. years ago and the child walked in and it was like, whoa, there's a child in the room. And then at the start of this, everyone was like, whoa, there's a. Now it's just. Yeah, everyone's working at home. Who, who else is going to come in? Bring the dog. Well, I'm trying to get Vet Bill in the building, and they won't let him in the building unless he gets the COVID nose thing. And he's like, Vet Bill's like, no way, I'm doing it. <laughs> but, John, you're 100% on. John, you are so on on how everybody's, like, relaxed about it. I tell you what, though, I wasn't relaxed when we first started doing this, and it was it was Kaza Keen and the cafe over at yours when we did this radio show and all you could hear was mugs and cups That's, and glasses. Yeah. Look, if you, go, you know, sometimes a help leaves barking. the dining room, I remember that. doors open into yeah. the kitchen. Coffee. You know? I That's what was they all not say. loving that. Who decides to do it in the kitchen? Who decides to do their show in the kitchen? The help shows up and they do the dishes. You know, what can I say? <laughs> Mrs. Keane will love that you're calling her the help. <laughs> After Coming thought, up, love it. Kathy Hochul, New York Lieutenant Governor, a stormy New York City. Stay safe, everyone. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Karina Mitchell. Congressional leaders are still haggling over final details of an almost $900 billion coronavirus stimulus package. Americans would get a one-time $600 payment, and there would also be $300 per week in supplemental unemployment benefits and aid for small businesses. But Democrats will have to give up their demand for aid to state and local governments. Republicans will drop their call for lawsuit liability protection. In Germany, a record increase in coronavirus infections. Authorities reported more than 45,000 new cases today. That's over twice the number from the day before. Earlier this week, fatalities also set a daily record. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has hinted that a hard shutdown that just took effect will remain in force beyond January. And the first major winter storm of the season is battering the northeastern U.S. It dumped rain, ice, and up to a foot of snow from Virginia to here in New York. And it's moving on to New England. At least three people were killed in car crashes. And the storm put more stress on hospitals struggling with the coronavirus. And the launch of Sony's PlayStation 5 console has been marred by scalpers. They're buying up scarce supplies at retail, selling them at higher prices. Most console sales have been pushed online. And that's allowing scalpers to use sophisticated bots to track them down. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Best, your weekly review of the most important business news analysis and interviews from Bloomberg Television around the world. Ken Burns, welcome to Bloomberg Big Decisions. We have always been a mixture of things. We are always stronger for that mixture. Growth is a way to stay competitive, delight more and more consumers. Are you worried that people won't take the vaccine? We remain uh, concerned about vaccine hesitancy. What is the one word of advice you'll take with you? Learn how to listen. And that is certainly something that has served me well. Ankiti, where do you go from here? It's a huge market. It's a huge opportunity. I want to go 100x from here. Our philosophy is to partner where we can and stand apart when we should. isn't it just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade we did see some pressure on the yuan we did see some pressure on the futures that is now being reversed valuations particularly you know sort of technology landscape have gotten to some pretty extraordinary uh, levels uh, so i think it's, it's not a surprise i don't think it's any indication of the beginning of the end but i do think markets don't like uncertainty involved in people's lives, state and local governments are, to, to a large extent. Um, the decision whether to, to provide more fiscal support to them is entirely in the hands of Congress. And, you know, I, they're in the middle of these discussions, and, and those, are, those are issues for them to decide. I would say that the picture is mi mixed. Fed Chair Jay Powell, we don't talk about fiscal policy, but how many times you heard that over the last 12 months or so? We don't talk about fiscal policy, we don't tell them what to do, but... For our audience worldwide this morning, good morning. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Rabravitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Here's the price action. This is what we look like this Thursday morning. We advance on the S&P 500. We might see an all-time high around the opening bell on the S&P. We advance one half of a 1%. In the FX market, euro dollar with a 122 handle again. New highs for 2020, up a third of 1%. The dollar just weaker broadly and very much so in G10. Cable out to a 136 handle briefly, right now 135.99. This will be the extent of our Brexit coverage today. Michel Barnier says a Brexit agreement is possible by Friday, Tom Keane. This is coming from the AFP. I stress possible. Possible, possible by Friday. Is that enough for you? That's it's enough possible. for me. I think you just killed it there, John. It was complete team coverage Thank you. of uh, <laughs> Brexit. Well. Right now, we're going to migrate to this pandemic and to what to do. What to do can be personified by a given restaurant in New York, in Chicago, in L.A., and points in between. The lieutenant governor of the Empire State is Kathy Hochul, and she joins us uh, this morning on any number of topics. Kathy, there's snow in New York. It's not going to work outdoors today. It's not going to work indoors either. How badly does small business, how badly do local and state need this fiscal uh, stimulus? We desperately need it. I've been saying this for months. Governor Cuomo has been saying this for months. Governor Cuomo leads the National Governors Association, a bipartisan group. Every one of them, Republicans and Democrats, have been clamoring for help from Congress to give to state local governments, but also direct relief for our small businesses in particular. I was in the city just yesterday, day before. The restaurants, I sat down with the restaurant owners, they are starving. They are literally starving. We have to help them. The federal government can right now help with the stimulus plan. It doesn't help the state and local governments, which is pathetic. Okay. It's an abdication of their responsibility, so we are in trouble. But at least get some money to the small businesses. Right now, the reporting, including our Kevin Cirilli, is state and local aid won't be in this bill. I guess it's going to get done. You know the timeline as well. 
What is your and Governor Cuomo's timeline to where things fall apart if you don't get aid in the stimulus? We, right now, our expectations are that it's not going to be in there, is what we're being told, unless there's some uh, you know, holiday gift that's going to come our way, which we pray for. But not, if we manage our expectations and it doesn't come, what we're going to do is to be able to allocate $1.5 billion of state money to the essential services that otherwise would not be funded. You cannot have a plan to have a mass distribution of vaccinations throughout the state and at the same time cut health care workers from hospitals and clinics. It doesn't work. So we're planning on a Joe Biden presidency. We expect that we'll be able to get more help from, uh, from the federal government. And I'll tell you, it all comes down to Georgia. It's amazing that the destiny of New York State is going to come down to who wins the election in the Senate races in the, in the runoffs in Georgia in early January. If, it's, if we can have a majority of Democrats, they understand this, they've lived this, they, they actually have empathy for people, they'll be able to get the job done. Uh, short of that, uh, we're going to have to deal with this in our budget in March, and we'll have to make serious, serious cuts at that time. But right now, we're just not going to do, we're not going to lay off teachers, we're not going to lay off health care workers, we're not going to lay off police officers right now just because Washington is failing abjectly. So we're going to get it done in New York State. We'll be in financial trouble, but we'll have to deal with it in our budget in March. All right, let's talk about what that means. You say major cuts. Does it also mean raising taxes? That is absolutely on the table. The last thing we've wanted to do in New York State is to raise taxes, particularly in these troubled times. We understand that that is not a good plan B, plan A. If it's not a good plan B, it's not a good plan C. But we may get to that point. If we don't get that, that essential assistance from the federal government to help offset the $15 billion that we're now facing, the whole we're facing, uh, it's, we're going to need to do something. We don't want to have to do that. The federal government can alleviate that. Again, this is not because of how New York manages its finances. This is because of a global pandemic. This is not anything we had any control over. We're doing the very best we can. And when we get this vaccine out, I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here, New York State will be the very first state to be COVID-free because we're going to be very aggressive about this. That should be good news to businesses in New York to know that states across this country are not going to be what we are in a few months. We're going to be very aggressive about this. Well, but it requires us to have money for health care workers to get that vaccine in people's arms. So let's talk about the process of rolling out the vaccine. You said that New York State will be among the first. What is the timetable for the rollout as you see it now? It's going on right now. We have different phases. We are in phase one, which is nursing home residents, staff, high-risk hospital workers. Those are literally out there uh, being administered in hospitals all over the state of New York. And we are proud that New York State had the very first uh, individual, one of our frontline workers in Queens, be the first in the nation. So we're excited about that. So we are also planning for phase two. Phase two will be essential workers and uh, priority general public, meaning those with uh, comorbidity, underlying health conditions. So we'll be focusing on them as well. So we don't think that's going to come until later January. But I'll tell you, if we can get more supplies, uh, again, this would be a wonderful gift if we can get more supplies when Moderna gets approved and Pfizer is able to come up with more. We will have no problem getting this uh, out to New Yorkers. We have a very aggressive plan that we've been working on since last July to get this into communities all over the state and in rural areas and in communities of color that have been hardest hit. We're going to have to overcome a lot of uh, reluctance, and that's part of our public relations campaign that's going on uh, as we speak. Lieutenant Governor, we only have so much time, about 60 seconds left, but if you could tell me where we are just in terms of considering another lockdown. We've heard a lot about that in the last couple of weeks. What's your take at the moment? We don't have to do that. We, there's, there is a plan. If people right now change their behavior, those who've been ignoring the mask mandates and ignoring our, our request that they stay socially distanced, if they change their behavior, literally we can get through these holidays and we'll start seeing a decline. Right now, New York State is about 6% infection rate. Uh, that is still the fourth lowest in the nation, so I give a lot of credit to New Yorkers for adhering to this. But it's trending upward, and we're worried about hospitalization capacity. Right now, we're at about 25% for the state uh, available, and if that yeah. starts getting much lower, then we have to talk about shutdowns. 
but that is not our that that is where we hope not to end up and we're not going to talk about that right now because we don't know what the behavior of people will be over the holidays so we can't control that individuals can control that and we may not have to talk about any more shutdowns that is the last thing we want to do here in the state of new york kathy thank you new york lieutenant governor there kathy hokel mm -hmm. kathy thank you very much Tom Keane, that's the situation at the moment, and it comes down to something we've been discussing continuously, healthcare capacity. That's what it will come down to for these yeah, policymakers. I totally, totally agree. I saw New Mexico, 102% of beds in New Mexico ICU right now. From New York and London this morning, good morning to you all worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. reason why 42% of people age 18 to 29 have no savings, partially because of things like student loans and other priorities like just being able to pay rent. But if you do have the means to save it all, here are some ways to get started. First, there's the one everyone thinks about, which is your 401k. This is a savings account that lowers your taxable income because you don't have to pay taxes on the money you contribute. The downside is that when you take that money out, you have to pay taxes based on the income bracket you're in at retirement age. But there's one major benefit to your 401k. Employers often offer contribution matching, which means essentially you're getting free money. Another option is the Roth IRA. With this, you pay taxes now on the money you put in. This gives you a savings account you can withdraw money from at retirement without having to pay taxes on the money you take out. You can only put $6,000 a year into a Roth. This is also a great option because with a traditional 401k, you may have to pay a penalty if you have to cash that money out early, but that's not the case with a Roth. Most financial experts suggest a combination of the two if you're able. To save more and worry less, you can set up automatic transfers into a savings account from your regular bank or credit union. Tools like Betterment can also help you set up automatic payments into a Roth IRA so that investing can be simple and mindless. investments and competition of the European ETF industry. Join us on Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe.
an argument to be made that perhaps we've gone up a little too far too fast. More money can potentially be put to work. I just don't really think it can continue in the pace that it has. The data is slowing, momentum is ebbing. We've seen those permanent layoffs increase. It's quite possible that you'll see numbers start to disappoint. A lot of this Band-Aid stimulus has already been priced in. The way people are spending, the timing of that spend has really shifted. Companies who have made it through 2020, when you get into 2021, something may just find it too difficult to keep going. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. Good morning to all of you driving on radio in a snowstorm up the East Coast all the way up to a very snowy Boston. We say drive careful. On television, we also say drive careful because it can always be a threat out on TV. You know, you get your TV going, you're watching Liverpool tots while you're driving home from the Fed press conference. That's what I was doing yesterday. John, I want to get right to the markets and I want to set up with those great voices sure. we heard at the top of the show. And we've got Cushman Morgan Stanley coming up and they're really cautious, Ellen Zentner and all. We just heard Porcelli Strong the divide, John, right now on the big call for next year, it's ginormous. On different time horizons, Tom, let's be clear about that. Morgan Stanley, cautious near term, much more constructive long term. And I think what's interesting about the moment we're in right now is the near term versus the long term or medium term for the Federal Reserve. Near term, the story's clear. We all get it. If things improve, they won't step back in. That's a powerful message that's in their forecasts. Middle of next year, things get interesting. Bob Michael and J.P. Morgan quoted the great philosopher Mike Tyson on my program <coughs> yesterday and said, Tom, that at some point the Fed's going to get smacked in the face by the data and inflation yeah. starts to pick up. How hard can they push back and say it's transitory? This is just transient. We'll move past it, focus on the future. Right. Does the pressure start to build in the same way Tom Porcelli of RBC talked about about 30 minutes ago? That's called 1994 or the Japanese, the Bank of Japan, about 2002, three when you get smacked in uh, the face. Lisa Bramow, you know, I'll steal from anybody to come up with a good phrase. I think <laughs> I actually came up with the pandemic partition. We're listening to the optimist. Pharaoh's talking about a turnaround in 2012. 21, and then there's the politics of the moment of the massive pandemic partition we're living. Yeah, and the question of what Congress will do when we are expecting that $900 billion bill, at least the text of it, possibly as soon as today. I want to build, though, on what John was talking about, this idea of what happens if yields rise, what happens if inflation rises, how does the Fed respond? And one thing Jay Powell said yesterday that was so telling when he was talking about the high valuations and equities, he said, it actually looks okay if you look at the Fed model, if you look at how low benchmark rates are. This whole equilibrium right now is so uncomfortable to steal from John Farrow. Because of this, it all is based on each other. As long as yields stay low, maybe these valuations can make sense. But what happens if things change? Tom? On the data check, it's real simple. The VIX 21.90 comes in nicely off the uh, chairman's press conference. Equities elevated. S&P futures up 18. Dow futures up 10. At the Dow level, 30,183. I'm going to call that 130 points or so below record high. John Farrell, that's all great, but the litmus paper of the global system is the currency market. Which pair interests you? Euro dollar, Tom. When does that become a problem? 122. I think we're there, aren't we? And what can they do about it? And I think the second point is the most interesting one. I don't think they can do a whole lot about it at all. But I think you're about to hear a whole lot more about dollar weakness. Some people might welcome it. I don't think Europe will be one of those people. Yeah, and I noticed uh, Canada, dollar Canada right now, a six standard deviation move. There's a fancy math to that, but all you got to know is the word ginormous fits, stronger Canadian dollar. Michael Kushma joins us now with Morgan Stanley with a few decades of experience. Has he seen it all? Well, maybe, maybe not. CIO of Global Fixed Income. We're thrilled he could join us as well. Ned Phelps up at Columbia, Michael Kushner, talks about dynamism. We've got a dynamic market right now. Things are moving. Everyone's adapting to it. What are you watching most closely in the next year? Well, we've been most focused on policy responses to the pandemic, both in terms of over the course of the summer 
as we moved into the fall, uh, in terms of the, the ebbs and flows of the pandemic getting better than getting worse, has policymakers, are they sticking to the script? Are they saying we need a boom in the economy in 21, 22, maybe even in 23 to recover the lost output and lost jobs that we had in 2020? Will they stick to the script and not give in or circumstances not change to kind of feel as if they're forced to change tax? So right now, Fiscal policy looks like back on track. Monetary policy, I was pretty happy with what the Fed and Powell said yesterday about staying the course of keeping substantial easing <laughs> intact until their long-term objectives are met. Easy to say it now, Michael. Harder to do it maybe in the middle of next year. Given the guidance they've produced and the guidance you've read through, how strong do you think that is to communicate to the market that even if things improve, if inflation starts to tick higher, we won't do anything? It's going to be a strong test because they have changed the way they're thinking about monetary policy. They reiterated yesterday they will focus on outcome-based policy changes, not forecast-based policy changes. So basically saying we will not change until we make substantial progress to lower unemployment and uh, higher inflation. And based upon trends in their forecasts of growth, unemployment rate won't get down to um, maximum employment until 2023. But will they stick to their guns as the economy hopefully does very is very strong next summer? And will they stick to it? The proof will be then, and we won't know until then. Michael, there's a question implicit in John's question, this idea of how much as a market participant, as a trader, as an investor, can you rely on policymakers to have the markets back, whether it's the Federal Reserve or whether it's policymakers down in Washington, D.C., to come through with some sort of fiscal plan that is currently, by all accounts, pretty baked into the market. How much faith do you give them in coming to the market's rescue, essentially, when there's bad news? Uh, it's it's difficult. There's a famous phrase, I can't remember who said it, you know, trust but verify. Um, I think you have to take them at their face word. They haven't done anything to change your, your views that they will follow through. But let's keep a close eye on what they say, um, how the economy is actually evolving. Is it evolving according to the way they think it's going to evolve? Is there a sudden surge in inflation? Um, Chairman Powell talked about transitory nation of uh, transitory nature of inflation for the past 10 years, that there's been no sense that any rise in inflation can be sustained. Is that true? We'll have to wait mm -hmm. and see. Michael Cushman, John Farrow and his entourage are going into pre-prep for tomorrow's The Real Yield. This is a huge deal uh, for him. 20, 30 people involved in London, London for the planning of the show. The only thing that matters is the real yield that we saw in the late summer of last year, down to a negative 1.10%. We're getting there quickly. Are we going to see a new low in the inflation-adjusted yield to an ever greater negative number? That's a very good question, because I think the real interest rate, the real yield, both short-term and long-term, is the best measure we have about the stance of monetary policy or financial conditions. And the rise in yields that we've seen in the back end of the yield curve from the lows in September, I think really ref just reflect the rise in inflation expectations we're seeing. So the real yields haven't gone up, which is another reason why the Fed price stood pat yesterday in terms of not adjusting quantitative easing, the weight of the average maturity, et cetera. So I think right now um, it will depend on the course of the, of the, the data. The Fed is looking through the weakness we're seeing right now in the sense that there was a chance that they may increase accommodation in some shape or form yesterday because of the near-term weakness in, in employment we'd likely to see. The sl slowdown we're seeing because of increased um, social distancing, um, et cetera. But it looks like they're looking through that right now. But if real yields rise, I think they will have to say something at least about it and maybe even do something if the rise is, too pre is premature. So what's the market call going into 21 for you, Michael? It's um, interest rates stay, short-term interest rates stay unchanged. Long-term interest rates drift higher a bit, but we have already moved into kind of a new range, call it you know, 85, 1% in 10-year treasuries, probably drift higher over the course of, of the first half of the year, but not dramatically so. And we'll see this slow grind tighter in credit spreads and emerging markets um, outperforming. I think dollar weakness is here to stay. Michael Kushma, thank you, sir. Great to catch up. Morgan Stanley Investment Management CIO of Global Fixed Income. Treasury market really well behaved in the last 24 hours. I don't think yields were up a single basis point yeah. yesterday.
this morning, unchanged, 0.92% on a 10-year term. I think it's an important observation. Notice the curve steepening when we got off the press conference. So, John, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to the real yield, and I do not mean your property. I mean the actual uh, real yield. It doesn't have the accelerative tendencies we saw in July of last year. But nevertheless, the, John, have you seen the vengeance of that thing down under 1% over the last three, four it's imp- sessions? It's impressive. It's impressive yeah. what's happened over the last year. And Lisa, how many people have told us that that's at the epicenter of their bullish call elsewhere? And this, to me, is the interesting conundrum. And it's interesting that you keep honing in on next year, the middle of next year. What happens if growth is higher than expected? What happens <clears throat> if inflation comes in higher than expected? And John, I thought it was interesting yesterday. What yields reacted to was signs that perhaps Congress would give direct payments to individuals, this idea of inflation. That has not been tested, John, and that could be is a John, real market test. Is yes, she turning optimism into gloom? Is that what she just did there? <laughs> My head's spinning. I think she did. I've got I mean, incredible. We all get a check. Gift at that. But wait for it. This is what might happen. Look, Lisa, if, it, if that does happen, I think the Federal Reserve Chair has the ability to make the argument that this is transitory. The argument that you would have to make for that to be durable is that you're going to get a check every single month. And those checks will keep coming. And that money will keep coming. And that demand will keep building. And I think that they think that what you're going to have is vaccinations start, the economy reopens, people flock back to services, you get that service sector inflation. But it's a quick bounce and it doesn't last. And then yeah. things stabilize. The only caveat here is Biden has talked about infrastructure spending, about actual stimulus and not just plugging the gap. That does not seem to be uh, accounted for in markets, John. Lisa Bramitz. I'm just saying. Jonathan just Farrow. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I enjoy it. I'm, I'm very happy you do it. I think it's oh, really, really important. Thanks. I'm to just make take positive that. points negative. <laughs> Much more still to come. With AGF Investments Chief US Policy Strategist Greg Vallier. We can hardly wait. Good. What will Lisa say next? <laughs> hey, Tom. I, it's a, it's a, it's a winter shining. wonderland. You could get skin cancer. But it's not Tom. There you go. There you go. What? What happens, Lisa? It's, it's a beautiful scene, Lisa. It's beautiful. Tell us about it. Oh, it's sunny. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Snowy. Okay, there we go. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> With the first word news, I'm Karina Mitchell. Congressional leaders are close to an agreement on an almost $900 billion coronavirus aid package. The plan includes a one-time $600 payment for individuals, plus there will be $300 per week in supplemental unemployment insurance payments and aid for small business. What's not included? Aid to state and local governments and lawsuit liability protection. Meanwhile, Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell sees light at the end of the tunnel. After the Fed's last policy meeting of the year, Powell sounded the most optimistic he's been since the virus pandemic began. At the same time, he pledged that the central bank will keep providing the economy with plenty of support well into the future. France's President Emmanuel Macron has tested positive for the coronavirus. The presidential palace says he took a test as soon as symptoms appeared, but it didn't say what symptoms he had. Macron will self-isolate for a week and will continue to work. The U.K. and the European Union are heading for a final battle over fishing rights. That's apparently the one major issue standing in the way of a post-Brexit trade deal. Officials are cautiously predicting an agreement within days. Focus on fish is a sign the two sides have largely settled their differences over another major issue, a level playing field for business. And Bitcoin has rallied roughly 20 percent this week and has gone over 23,000 for the first time. Analysts say the digital currency's run still has further to go. Bitcoin and the larger Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index have both more than tripled this year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Karina Mitchell. This is Bloomberg.
expense is on a path towards CO2 neutral uh, mobility. So we have flicked the switch there and really uh, we're going to step by step electrify everything. And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified. This is a market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. He's going to help build back better with jobs and hope, with vision and execution. We selected Pete for transportation because the department is at the intersection of some of our most ambitious plans. President-elect Joe Biden putting his team together from New York and London this morning. Good morning to you all alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Here's the price action going into jobless claims about 12 minutes away in the United States. Equities up 20 points on the S&P. We are up five-tenths of 1% with all-time highs in sight. In the bond market, unchanged, well-behaved in the Treasury market. Yield 0.9196%. And in foreign exchange, story of the morning, cross-asset worldwide, dollar weaker. Dollar index, a break of 90 Got to go back to 2018 for some of these levels. Spring 2018 to see the euro where it is right now, Tom. Euro dollar, 122 and almost 50. Watch the emerging markets as well. We haven't touched on them today at Damien Sassauer's world, but I'll tell you, folks, EM is uh, sprightly, to say the least. Right now, on the data, on the doing of the math, of understanding the fabric of this nation, Greg Vallier is immensely qualified with AGF Investments. We speak to him about stimulus. We speak to him about your Washington. Greg Vallier, if you look at the mayors here, it's real simple. From New York to Indianapolis, the first 13 cities are all Democrat, and then Jacksonville slips in, Fort Worth slips in, and El Paso slips in with Republican mayors. Do Republican mayors need state and local aid? Yes, Tom. Good morning. The need is really acute. It's a desperate need for aid right now. And in a lot of states run by Republicans, let's take Ohio, for example, there's also a need. So th this is one of the great flaws of this bill that probably will pass in the next few days. What happens after this bill? I mean, you're real good at getting out two, three weeks. Let's go about two, three months. Is there a second stimulus right behind this? I think there has to be. The Georgia election will affect a lot. I mean, if the Republicans win both seats, it makes it less likely. But even in that scenario, Mitch McConnell needs protection on liability for his business friends. Uh, the Democrats, as you mentioned, need uh, state and local aid. And by the end of the winter, we'll be running out of unemployment benefits again. So, yeah, I think there's another bill coming. Maybe it's late February, early March. I just want to work out who's got the leverage here on those two issues, Greg. Good question. Do you think the Republicans hate state aid more than the Democrats hate liability protection? Yes, I do. And the Republicans have this narrative that I think, frankly, is not true, that the states are profligate, that they spend money recklessly, they don't run things well. No, the states are – there's an imminent move to lay people off. There's going to be huge layoffs in city governments because the cities have run out of money seems to me, Greg, this just comes down to January 5th then. January 5th either goes the Democrats' yeah. way or it doesn't. Otherwise, state aid's not happening. Is it that simple, Greg? Yeah, the polls, of course, if you believe polls anymore, but the polls show this is a virtual tie in, in both of the races. So, you know, God forbid, I mean, there could be recounts in Georgia, I and mean, this, this nightmare will go on and on. But if there's a clear verdict in Georgia, and let's say Mitch McConnell is still uh, the House, uh, the Senate majority leader, whatever aid bill we get will be modest. On the other hand, if the Democrats get both seats, we'll get a big bill from Joe Biden, over a trillion, well over a trillion. There, was, there were a number of reports yesterday talking about Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell talking in private discussions with other GOP senators and saying that passing this bill will help the Republicans win that Georgia runoff election. Is that your sense as well that this would give a material boost to the Republicans' chances? Yes, it is. I mean, there are a lot of people. You make a good point. There's a lot of people in Georgia who need aid. And I think the longer we wait, the longer this looks like this typical congressional dysfunction, uh, the longer I think it actually helps the Democrats. Then when you talk about if the Democrats do take the Senate and they do gain the majority and uh, Joe Biden is able to pass a trillion dollar plan, as you put out there, what are you looking at in terms of what will be in that bill and how easily it'll pass, uh, given where we are with the moderates as well? 
Yeah, more checks, more checks to people, more direct aid. I mean, I think all of this, this bill we get probably over the weekend, plus the second bill, I think the bottom line here is that a recession becomes yeah. much less likely if we get these two bills. Greg, 1975, you and I remember the Daily News headline, Ford to New York City mm -hmm. drop dead. Okay, Trump to New York City drop dead. That's really what we've got now. When we start seeing city layoffs of size, whether it's New York or Indianapolis or even Phoenix, how will your Washington respond? Well, there will be something done, but it's like everything, like masks, you name it, everything's politicized now. And I think a lot of these cities uh, are not, they're not bad people. They just have had a, a drop in revenue, obviously, with all the restaurants closed. And they've had a big increase in spending on first responders. I mean, it, it's not that they're evil or profligate. They, they're in desperate shape. And I think that will become more widely appreciated over the next couple of months. Greg, this warrants a full conversation in and of itself, so forgive me for reducing this to one question at the end of this conversation. What is happening with the hacking of the U.S. government? Is Russia responsible, and what are you learning about that at the moment, Greg? Well, the, the, it is a serious story, John. Uh, the former director of security had a, a lengthy column today. I forget if it was the New York Times or the Washington Post, but a, a lengthy column on the damage that's been done, not just to U.S. government agencies, but to U.S. companies. It's brazen. It's going to have to be stopped. It starts Joe Biden's administration off on a pretty frosty tone with Moscow. It just got colder. Greg Vallier, yes, thank is. you, sir. AGF yep. Investments Chief, U.S. Policy Strategist. Tom Keane, just so many things on the radar at the moment that something yeah. as important as that is really not getting enough conversation at the moment. It's not getting enough conversation, and it really falls into the international financial community. I learned that from John Taylor, who I know will be with Bloomberg uh, later today, the great Stanford professor after 9-11. You're right, John, that these things that seem not Bloombergian they end up folding in. And the, the gentleman who wrote the op-ed, I don't have it in front of me right now, uh, we've interviewed a number of times when he served President Trump. And I think one time was at Davos, actually, John. And, and I'll, I'll make very clear, you're, you're dead on, John, to bring up that question. It does fold in. It does matter. And this is where, arguably, President-elect Joe Biden has the most power, Tom. If we have a divided government, this is well, where he can put his mark on things, on foreign policy, on trade, on these issues. Yeah, there's no question that he can do that. And, he, you know, clearly he's been allied-centric here as he begins to set up uh, his administration. I do want to point out, John, that one thing percolating I saw was Governor Cuomo of New York as attorney general. Maybe that's a discussion for next week. I heard the same thing as well, Tom, although there's some other names in the mix as well. For our audience worldwide this morning. Good morning. Yeah. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Counting you down to the opening bell. That's about an hour away. In five minutes' time, we'll have initial jobless claims in America. And in the last couple of weeks, we've had the wrong kind of upside surprise on claims in the United States. Throw in a downside surprise on retail sales this week. Some real concern about the economy rolling over as we work our way deeper into winter, just as the vaccinations begin. Can we build that bridge to the other side? The hope is that we get a deal down in Washington, D.C. That is the focus of our coverage through to the weekend. For our audience worldwide, here's the price action. Futures up 20 on the S&P. We advance 0.55% on the S&P 500, approaching all time highs, potentially the it's at there. the opening bell. It's out there. I think you might have missed your chance, Tom. A couple of times cash. over the last few decades. Have a pullback. In the FX <laughs> market, euro dollar 122.46. I've got two more days of herding cats before Christmas.
instruments on board uh, include a dual frequency radar altimeter. And this is the primary instrument of the mission, and that's the one that's measuring sea surface height, significant wave height, and wind speed over the ocean. And from those measurements, we can actually have uh, the superb measurements that we expect um, of sea level rise, but also the waves. Uh, the significant wave height, which is the top one third of, of, of the waves, if you were to, to, to look at them in time. Rise is accelerating, and it is not geographically uh, uniform. In some regions, the rate of rise is uh, two to three times faster than the global mean. This means that in this region, uh, the elevation since the beginning of the 90s is uh, now uh, nearly uh, 30 centimeters, which is not negligible. such an interesting new world. The world is changing. For us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best. Well, everyone is zigging, we're zagging. We feel like we can maybe help people out more. We have an enormous number of big ideas. What we're trying to accomplish at Bumble is that you can drive profit and purpose. And they can coincide, they can coexist. And in fact, they fuel one another. It is possible we could have negative growth if this resurgence gets bad enough and mobility falls off enough. We knew that things were going to slow down um, after the bounce back in the third quarter, and you're seeing that in the data now. We're going to be well into 2021 before there's some sort of equilibrium that we achieve. With a new administration coming to Washington, changes are undoubtedly in store, from the economy to foreign policy to public health. I'm David Weston. Join me for a Balance of Power special report, a look ahead to the next four years, this weekend on Bloomberg Television. He's going to help build back better with jobs and hope with vision and execution. We selected Pete for transportation because the department is at the intersection of some of our most ambitious plans. President-elect Joe Biden there putting his plan together. We'll need a plan for this labor market. The data coming out very shortly from New York and London. Good morning to you all. Mike McKee has that data. Hey, Mike. Good morning, John, or maybe not so good morning if you're looking for good economic news. Jobless claims higher, much higher than forecast, coming in at 885,000. That's up from 853,000 unrevised, waiting for that revision now. Uh, and the forecast was for 818. So we are definitely seeing the signs of a economy that is slowing down and people are uh, losing jobs once again. Now, you can't trust the actual numbers, of course. Uh, the government accounting office uh, suggested that the, the numbers can be off, but the trend is definitely not good. This is a time of year when it's hard to uh, seasonally adjust because of all the holidays, but uh, you know you can't look at 885,000 and say that's good news at all. Uh, housing starts come in at 1,547,000 on a uh, seasonally adjusted annual rate that is up by 17,000 from the prior month, 1.2% uh, increase. Building permits, 1,639,000 is up from uh, 1,545,000. So uh, the housing market continues to be strong and, of course, with the Fed yeah. rates where they are. Now, the really bad news of the day was something that I wasn't even anticipating. That's the Philadelphia Fed Index comes in at 11.1. Yeah. It was 26.3 last month. The forecast had been for a drop to 20, but it dropped <clears> significantly more than that. And the employment number is the one that really caught my eye. Uh, let me uh, call that up here. Uh, it dro it uh, dropped so far down. Um, the uh, Philadelphia Fed uh, employment in number is at 8.5 versus 27.2. Okay, Mike, but let's dovetail this, and you're expert at this, and Steve Stanley's going to be on as well. I know John really wants to talk about the labor economy. Meld those two together, the claims numbers, five weeks, the wrong trend, with that grim Philadelphia number. How does a guy like you meld the two together? Well, I think what we want to do is look towards what will happen with non-farm payrolls. And last week was the survey week for payrolls. So the idea that jobless claims rose significantly, never mind the 
complete amount, but they rose significantly. And the, the Philadelphia Fed number comes in so low, we'll watch the rest of these regional indicators. But it does tell you the labor market is struggling right now. So, Mike, I'm trying to bring all these numbers together. We can't rely completely on them. They're messy. Uh, but, yes, the initial jobless claims in, came in much higher than expected. Continuing claims, the ongoing people receiving aid uh, from state and federal governments, actually went down. Is there anything that actually came in below expectations? Can we draw anything from that that perhaps is a different message? No, you really can't because two things are happening there. One, uh, the continuing claims number is a uh, week behind the other numbers, but we're also seeing uh, the number of people who are getting on extended benefits uh, rise significantly. So we're seeing people move from continuing claims, which includes up to 26 weeks, and then you go on to the long term, and you see that rise by uh, 79,000 in the past week. Uh, so, you know, even though that is uh, yeah. delayed significantly, it does show you that uh, people are still out there uh, not finding jobs. And that's going to be the hard part for the economic recovery. We've had faster growth and the unemployment rate has fallen in part because people have stopped looking for work and you still have a lot of people who uh -huh. were employed back in February who are not employed now and it's going to take a while to get them back into the labor force. Uh, Michael McKee, thank you so much and I can't say enough about you and Rich Miller yesterday at the press conference with really piercing questions. John Farrell, is there the same doubt about labor statistics in the United Kingdom? Oh, there's far more doubt about labour statistics in the UK, Tom. That's because so many people have been furloughed and have been supported by the government's policy to furlough them through much of this year. So the unemployment rate isn't really the unemployment rate. And I know there's a similar story in many other places across Europe as well. And that's been a feeling in the United States. You can't quite get a clear read on things. For claims, yeah. there's been so much churn in the US labour market over the last nine months or so that it's been difficult to take. I think that's the problem people might be having for this month as well. We've right. got Bloomberg Economics looking for a negative print for the month of December for payrolls in the United States, and there's supportive <clears throat> data around that. The claims are moving in the wrong direction. I wonder what other people think about that, Tom. Well, we'll have to see. Long ago and far away, and John Farrell knows this from his math at Warwick, and Stephen Stanley lived it with Amherst Pierpont. It was called plug and chug. You got a formula, something Newtonian, and you throw in the data and come up with an answer. Stephen Stanley, can you plug and chug now on the American economy? Can you take the data, throw it in, and actually come up with an outlook? Not if you're using your pre-pandemic formulas. There's no doubt about it that the data have changed. I think with the claims numbers, you know, a big part of the issue is the changes in the program, the extra benefits that were on offer um, earlier in the year just led to a lot of unusual activity, people filing that weren't eligible before, probably a lot of people filing that didn't, you know, shouldn't have gotten benefits. So the levels of those claims numbers are definitely off. Um, but I think to Mike's point from before, the fact that it is rising is consistent with what we're seeing out there, which is that as the pandemic intensifies, um, you're starting to see a little bit of retrenchment in some of those high contact industries. Things moving in the wrong direction, Steve, and it's December 17th, it's still early, but if you had to pencil in a call for the payrolls report for this month, <clears throat> what would it be right now? Yeah, I have my forecast, but I'm going to say probably um, still positive, but certainly weaker than in November. Um, I think, you know, the, the areas that are most sensitive to the pandemic, restaurants and some of the service categories are probably going to be down in December. But there's still, you know, a good amount that's going on that's good in the uh, in the economy right now, certainly housing, I think manufacturing um, and some other categories. So we'll see how it plays out. But I think, you know, the, the markets have concluded that whatever happens in November, December, um, things are going to turn up next year. So, you know, I think in some ways it's less important now what happens in the near term because of the prospect of vaccines. Experience, the experience of this year, Stephen, that we can turn the economy off, turn it back on again, and it will snap right back really quickly. And that the parallel is not what happened 10 years ago in the financial crisis. It's what happened maybe in China through this year. If we can get a vaccination program ramped up, then what China's managed to achieve, we can achieve in Europe and the United States. Do you share that view, Stephen, that I've heard so many times in the last couple of weeks? I absolutely do. I, I thought that from the beginning, that the recovery would be faster and uh, more vigorous than, than most people thought. I mean, that was certainly true in the spring and summer. Um, we've had a bit of a setback now, which is understandable given the evolution of the pandemic. 
Um, but, you know, I, I do see the economy getting back to something close to normal in the second half of next year. One thing that John was talking about is this churn that we're seeing in the labor market. Initially, people who are getting laid off were the lower wage workers. Is that changing? I mean, is this churn leading to more higher paid uh, wage, uh, higher paid wage uh, employees getting laid off and trying to find something perhaps with lower income? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the impetus at the margin um, is still going to be that low paid. It's, a, it's those high contact industries. I mean, restaurants is kind of the poster child for that dynamic, and those are still going to be mostly uh, lower wage jobs. I, I, I think the, you know, the white collar um, phenomenon that you discussed is one that's going to be much slower moving. So it is there in the background, but it's going to get o overwhelmed most months, I think, uh, until the pandemic is done, simply because the, the greater churn is occurring in those service industries. Meanwhile, given the uncertainty that you were talking about, Stephen, with respect to the actual numbers, when do they matter? When do they change the trajectory of the recovery to you? Well, I, I think when when we've kind of turn the corner on the pandemic, really. I mean, it, it sounds like from the public health officials that we're talking about probably the spring when most people will have access to a vaccine. And I think at that point, you know, the the um, th that's when we're really going to have a sense of how much of what we've seen is going to be structural as opposed to just strictly short term. Uh, and I think that's the real question from the market's perspective. I mean, do you, do you get all the way back to where we were in February of 2020, or are you only going to get part way back? Are you going to have an unemployment rate at 6% or 5%? Um, and, and, you know, I think that's really the question at this point that the markets are probably most focused on um, heading into next year. Stephen Stanley, you've got a great clarity about what they do, not what they say. What are corporations in America doing right now? Not the PR, not the lip service, not the CEO blather. What are they really doing in terms of investment and in terms of strategy given this economy? Well, I mean, the, the, certainly the durable goods numbers that we've gotten so far this year have been surprisingly and consistently better than expected. So investment, especially in equipment, has been... Um, I think encouraging. It suggests that businesses are willing to look past this. And, and certainly, I think businesses have a longer uh, time horizon in their decision making than most households. So that makes sense. Um, again, as the, as the hope that we can get back to something close to normal uh, gets closer and closer, I think businesses are going to get back more and more toward a uh, business as usual approach. That's, I think, you know, to your point, though, that's mostly for big businesses. If you're a small business and you're in one of these sectors that's being restrained by um, social distancing rules, then obviously it becomes a day-to-day, -day, uh, maybe week-to-week -week, uh, endeavor just to stay alive. So, um, you know, hoping to see something from Congress this week. Uh, but there are a lot of businesses, yeah. I think, that are just hoping to make it to next month and, and next year. Small business in the labor market certainly asking for it much, much more loudly in the last couple of weeks. Stephen, thank you. Stephen Stanley, Amherst Pierpont, Chief Economist. Treasuries respond to the wrong kind of upside surprise in the labour market 10 minutes ago. Yields now almost down a basis point in the session. No drama. 91 basis points on a 10-year. This is a theme we spotted and gotten used to and expected, Tom, through the month of December. You saw it in the payrolls report for November. You've seen it in claims the last couple of weeks, the wrong kind of upside surprise on jobless claims. Uh, for those of you on radio, it's really evident, and TV had a nice chart on it uh, as well, John. You look at the, U the U.S. tenure right now, and I'm sorry, this is more than just a lower yield. This is a real drop down here uh, that we see in the dynamics. I'm, the, 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 the real yield, John, to, to, to go to your interesting program tomorrow, negative 1.0549. Look at how that has moved in the last two days. Yeah, inflation expectations creeping higher. Nominals have been really steady, and yeah. you capture the real yield story perfectly. But looking at nominal yields, there's a lid on this right now, and the Fed didn't need to extend the average maturity of its asset purchase program. Talked about a little bit, maybe doing it in the future, but, Tom, seemingly this data is enough to hold things back right now. Your 10-year, 91 basis points. From New York and London this morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Karina Mitchell. Congressional leaders are still haggling over the final details of an almost $900 billion coronavirus stimulus package. 
Americans would get a one-time $600 payment, and there would be $300 per week in supplement unemployment benefits and aid for small businesses. But Democrats will have to give up their demand for aid to state and local governments. Republicans will drop their call for lawsuit liability protection. In Germany, a record increase in coronavirus infections. Authorities reported more than 45,000 new cases today. That's over twice the number from the day before. Earlier this week, fatalities also set a daily record. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has hinted that a hard shutdown that just took effect will remain in force beyond January. And the first major winter storm of the season is battering the northeastern U.S. It dumped rain, ice, and up to a foot of snow from Virginia to New York. And it's moving on to New England. At least three people were killed in car crashes. And the storm put more stress on hospitals struggling with the coronavirus. Facebook and Twitter have now reversed changes meant to curb election misinformation. The social networks say the temporary changes are no longer needed. Twitter had made it harder to retweet other posts. Meanwhile, after the election, Facebook had boosted news sources it considered authoritative. And Bloomberg's learned that Goldman Sachs plans to boost bonuses for the trading division by up to 20 percent. That's business reclaimed its stature as the firm's golden goose. There was a 49 percent jump in revenue this year through September after a sluggish decade for Goldman traders. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Karina Mitchell. This is Bloomberg. biggest problem. Climate change is happening. And the world's most innovative solutions. Transport, industry, uh, buildings, electricity, all of those things. Everything you need to know about our changing environment, the politics of global warming. We can and we will deal with climate change. In the fight against climate change, Bloomberg Green has you covered. We have some good news in terms of vaccines and a chance to overcome the health crisis, but we are not there yet. We need the fiscal stimulus. We need it relatively quickly because I can see where the second wave is coming. You can see consumer spending beginning to get impacted again. What we need is we need surveillance to be stronger. Uh, we need uh, public health measures because you have no other way at the beginning. This is your best weapon and you need to use it well. The good news is that both the vaccines and the therapeutics, in particular the antibodies, are coming along and will start to bring that number way down. We don't just need more investment in public health. We must also rethink how we value health. I do believe a targeted fiscal stimulus is, is going to be in order to really begin a more equalized economy. Give you a sense of the real-time action, the 10-year yield tumbling now 11 basis points, so continuing in this knee-jerk, risk-off field. experience 
and really how we might be able to um, uh, combine together to really create this fantastic public company. And so uh, we kind of got into this back thing a little bit before it became such a hot method of going public. bonds and you can buy longer maturity uh, bonds and that would put more downward pressure on long-term interest rates but that's really not the problem facing the economy right now the level of interest rates is not holding the economy back I mean, you look at the housing sector it's doing very well you think consumer durables are doing very well so if the fed did more it really wouldn't have that much consequence the housing sector's flying. The labor market at the moment, not so much. That was Bill Dudley, the former New York Fed president. For our audience worldwide this morning, good morning from New York and London alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Coming up on the open in about 15 minutes' time, Bank of America Securities head of U.S. rate strategy, Mark Cabana. Very timely conversation yeah. with Mr. Cabana coming up in the next yeah. hour. Tom J Keane, John. you and I have just one show left together after this one. Uh, that's, I, one. I can't, I, they got me medicated. John, you should stay around because if you ever come back to New York, you're going to want the first six months free, right? I will be wanting the first six months free. Have you seen what the brokers are doing right yeah. now? They're offering the 14-month contract with two months for free so that you get the luxury of that lower rent for 14 months and then pop. Yeah. You snap back to normal, maybe. At some well, point in spring 21, Tom. Have someone in your entourage as you leave us uh, take notes here with Mitch, Ro Mitch Rochelle. The real friend. Uh, Mitch Rochelle is a uh, wonderful Tom's founding, doing the negotiating for me. Founding <laughs> partner, Macro Trends Advisors on real estate. We get a huge response from Mr. Rochelle. Is on. Mitch, I got commercial questions. I got residential questions. But let's pick it up for young Farrell here as well. How desperate are they to rent units in these big pandemic cities? Um, they, I wouldn't say it's desperation right now because I think demand is starting to leach back into the market. So at least they're they're making progress. I think months ago they were felt like they were in free fall and they were lowering rents and giving free rent uh, simultaneously. Now they're trying to figure out how to strike the right balance. John mentioned the 14th month lease. That's one of the tricks that they're using. So I don't think it's panic mode. But certainly landlords want to do whatever they can to get the building filled. Is construction dead? Yeah, new construction. Uh, you know, if you see a crane in the skyline, they'll likely finish what they started. But I don't see new speculative construction of apartments in cities for quite a while. Mitch, is there any way to get a true read on some of these big urban areas in terms of real estate values until the pandemic subsides? I, Lisa, I think the spring buying season, uh, when people are sort of out and about, will be the first leading indicator about what condos are trading for. The problem is there's tremendous overhang on the market of people who you know have listed their condos for sale and then sort of taken them off of uh, the market. Um, and that's actually extra demand, uh, rather supply, that's messing up prices. Because if you have a, a two-bedroom condominium and you can't sell it, what do you do? You rent it. So now you're competing with the landlords. Um, so I think we have to wait until the spring to further for, you know, first market clearing prices that we can rely on to see where it's landed. All right. Before we get those uh, sort of tea leaves, do you have a sense of how much credence this exodus from big cities uh, really is in terms of having lasting power? Uh, I think it's it's other than temporary, but um, it's it's not permanent. Uh, I didn't mean to overly nuance that. So I think there was a pre-existing trend of people wanting to move out of the cities for a variety of reasons that got accelerated. But as some of the folks can't mm -hmm. find homes to buy in the burbs, uh, they're yeah. staying. What you're also seeing is people moving from out of boroughs uh, that were cheaper into Manhattan because Manhattan's been repriced. Mitch, a question I've asked you before. You gave me a really smart answer, but it still confounds me and our listeners and viewers. All those stores are empty. Why don't they just lower the rents? It, that, that is the question, uh, and hopefully I can harken back to my smart answer from the past. But I think it's happening now, Tom. Um, they, they're getting there. The problem is that they're remaining empty because there's no one to take them. So I think for a while, landlords were being greedy, for lack of a better term, uh, and trying to keep the rent level that they wanted. But right now, I don't even think there's a tenant for some of those spaces. Uh, you see some pop-up stores uh, for the holidays, 
But now when you, you enter this new phase of, you know, no indoor dinings, we've taken restaurants out of the mix. I don't think, I think there's just a, a dearth of tenants for some of that space. So, and I, I don't know what, what becomes of it. So what do you say to the politicians struggling this, with this in your political battle? What is the urgency Mitch Rochelle has to get some enthusiasm in commercial and retail America? I think we need to create incentives for people to start businesses. And the thing that will likely happen, Tom, is all of these businesses that go out of business tragically, somebody new is going to sort of take over that restaurant that closed. And uh, I think what we need to do is create incentives in cities for people to want to put capital at risk and open businesses, even retail ones. I mean, New York City is a foot traffic city, so storefront retail makes sense. It has to be repriced. And I think politicians need to find a way to incentivize people to take risks. In the meantime, there's also the question about offices. Do you feel like the office is more dead or less dead than people currently think? I think it's less dead than people think. Uh, you know, we're all, listen, I would love nothing more than to be in the studio with you guys and then and as I'm leaving, load up my uh, briefcase with Cheez-Its, okay? So <clears throat> that's a that's a sixth-floor Bloomberg inside joke there. But the fact of the matter is I think people are yearning to get back together again. So I think there's demand from employees to get back to the office. I think it's the employers that are holding them back. So I think if you want have employees that want to go back to work, as soon as it's safe, I think you're going to see them back in the office. Jeez, it's Mitch Rochelle is the reason I joined Bloomberg. <laughs> Mitch Rochelle with us with Macro Trends Advisors, hugely popular on what we care about, Jesus? which is our abode. Cheez Its, Lisa, they're gluten free. Give me a break. <laughs> You're the one okay. that's always talking about Mitch, gluten free. Thanks so much. Yeah, Not well, they're me. Yeah, they're gluten free. I try to keep it under three bags a day. <laughs> Robin Hood. Let's start with first principles. What's Robin Hood? Inform everyone. Robin Hood is the free trading platform catering to retail free. traders. Yeah, well, that's what people talk about. Um, meanwhile, they've been accused by the SEC, by others, uh, for basically encouraging non educated traders of getting into markets and making riskier and riskier bets right now, just crossing uh, the Bloomberg that Robinhood is going to pay $65 million to, to end this <clears throat> SEC probe yeah. over order payments. Interesting to see the scrutiny that they've come under as they become increasingly popular. Tom. You know, Lisa, I would have spent $65 million this morning. It was like 2 a.m. I'm going down Park Avenue. On the Bentley? With the, with the, no, with the, the Bentley's in the garage. We don't bring the Bentley out like this. It's the snowshoes. And, and I got the snowshoes on, and I needed glide wax, and I left it at home. And what I would kill right now for just a little thingy of glide wax to get, you know, you get the, the little so, snowy around your shoes. Tom, do you have an entire shelf of wax? You've got bow tie wax. You yeah, we do. But the, well, there are different parts. You've got canoe wax. What else? Vet Mill's got wax, you know, around the <laughs> nose to look good as well. But waxy 2020. You know, this is a serious issue. I mean, I had a complete fail with the snowshoes this morning, and Basim saved me. Came along in the the Hummer to get me to work, but you know, it was tough. I'm still thinking about Cheez Its. I gotta say, I don't know that I've seen you eating Cheez Its recently. Yeah. You know, no, actually, me and the 108th mayor of New York, we love our Cheez-Its. Oh, yeah. Futures up 17, Dow Futures up 85. An important conversation. John Taylor of Stanford University later. Stay with us on Bloomberg Radio, on Bloomberg Television. Drive careful, those of you on the East Coast.
really a reminder, isn't it, just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the yuan. We did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. and London for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is the countdown to the open. 30 minutes away from the opening bow. Futures up four tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. We begin with the big issue. Closing in on a deal in Washington, D.C. We made major headway. It's not a done deal yet, but we are very close. We will not leave town until we've made law. As we race the clock to reach a final accord. We're hammering out a targeted pandemic relief package. We are close to an agreement. Further targeted relief is now a month overdue. Everyone wants to get this done. We committed to continuing these urgent discussions until we have an agreement. The finish line is in sight. So more fiscal aid could well be on the horizon, more support, more bond issuance, and a Federal Reserve chairman committed to keep on buying. We are committed to using our full range of tools to support the U.S. economy to achieve our goals. We will continue to use our tools to support the economy for as long as it takes until the job is well and truly done, until substantial further progress has been made. That last line, leaving Wall Street wondering the obvious, just what is substantial progress? The substantial further progress means what it says. It means we'll be looking for employment to be substantially closer to assessments of its maximum level and inflation to be substanti substantially closer to our 2% longer run goal before we start making adjustments to our purchases. Substantial progress means what it says. Was that helpful? Joining us now, Kevin Cirilli and Kelly Lines. Kevin, let's talk about the moment. 30 minutes ago, jobless claims once again moving in the wrong direction. The pressure is on down in D.C. Are they responding, Kevin? Yes, they are. And in fact, we're anticipating, based upon sources that I talk with, some type of major breakthrough announcement in terms of an agreement on fiscal stimulus uh, in the next 24 hours. Now, it comes at a time in which Democrats are not going to be uh, receptive of the uh, lack of additional aid for state and local governments, but are being told that they will have another opportunity to negotiate such an agreement once President-elect Joe Biden is sworn into office. From the Republican perspective, Leader McConnell, not able to get the liability protections that he had uh, for months fought for in terms of liability protections uh, in wake of the pandemic. But what he is seeing is a chess move of sorts that this could serve as a check and a balance on the next round of negotiations if, keyword if, that were to come to fruition in President-elect Biden's first 100 days. And then finally, yesterday, headline on the Bloomberg terminal in which Leader McConnell said privately to members of the Republican caucus that he believes passing fixed fiscal stimulus would be a political boost to Senators Perdue and Leffler, who of course are on the ballot in Georgia on January 5th. That's added a new sense of urgency to the bipartisan talks that are underway virtually around the clock here in Washington, D.C. Kevin's really down in D.C. Thank you, Kevin. That urgency not seen in this equity market right now. In about 27 minutes, we could have a record high at a cash open. Taking a look at the market desk is Kelly Lines. Hey, Kaylee. Hey, John. Well, the market is certainly waiting with bated breath for any kind of news on a fiscal aid package, but clearly there is optimism that a deal is going to get done with futures pointing to a higher open. S&P e minis up about 17 points right now, relatively even gains across the major indices. There is their slightest margin of underperformance for the Russell 2000 and outperformance for the NASDAQ 100 futures. Oddly, obviously, you also have risk sentiment aided by the Fed yesterday. No one knows what substantial means, John, but the narrative seems to be it's still lower for longer. The Fed still is not going anywhere. It has the markets back. And speaking of the Fed, there was a lot of chatter about what could happen in the bond market should the Fed disappoint the market. Would yields cross above 1% on the 10-year? That didn't happen. You did see a knee-jerk reaction 
yields moving upward, but they retreated right back down, and we are flat over the past two days on the 10-year yield, right around 90 basis points. And I would be amiss not to talk about the dollar as well, John. Weakened in yesterday's session, and those declines continue this morning. It's weaker against everything in the G10 space, down about four-tenths of 1%. The Bloomberg Dollar Spot Index, of course, is down more than 5% this year. Could be its worst annual performance since all the way back in 2017, and the dollar currently at the lowest since April of 2018, John. Kelly Lines, thank you very much. Euro dollar taking a little look at life around 122 and seemingly getting comfortable. 136 in sight for cable as well early this morning. The outlook for the bond market, this is the story. Right now, 90 basis points on a 10-year, even as we're about to sign off on a deal down in D.C. Megan Green of the Harvard Kennedy School saying fiscal sobriety is overrated. She writes in the Financial Times, the most important New Year resolution is to embrace spending and not worry about budget deficits. Megan joins us now for more. Megan, just speak to the moment that we're in right now and why we can afford to do this. Yeah, I mean, I think if we learn one thing from the Trump administration, it's that actually you can spend a lot and the traditional side effects don't kick in. So you can have a huge boost of fiscal stimulus and not really get any inflation to speak of, as we did in, in 2018. You know, we had the tax reform, the, the spending bill, and inflation hardly eked up. You can also have a massive fiscal stimulus and not get any crowding out in the private sector. I mean, bond yields have just fallen as our deficit has grown. So I think given that borrowing costs are so incredibly low now, real uh, yields are actually negative. I mean, I think that the Fed and the markets are pretty much egging the government on to go ahead and borrow to, to fight this war. Megan, when you talk about sustainability of the debt load, you talk about borrowing costs. Policymakers, as you know, particularly in Europe, talk about the debt load as a percentage of GDP. They talk about the budget deficit as a percentage of GDP. Why is it the right way to look at just purely borrowing costs, debt servicing costs? Well, uh, usually you look at debt to GDP, um, and that debt is a stock, a backward-looking stock, and GDP is a flow, so it, it's better to look at on stock-stock terms or flow-flow terms. And if we want to look in flow-flow terms, then you have to look at what you're going to have to pay over the course of the year relative to what you're raking in, so that would be borrowing costs relative to GDP. It's just a better indicator. It incorporates things like you know inflation growth, borrowing costs. Um, so it's a better way to look at kind of how we're going to pay for this or how we're going to service it rather um, over the coming year and over years to come. If you're worried about inflation accelerating, and there are a couple of reasons that we might actually see an acceleration of inflation. If that happens, you know, the central bank might have to hike into it and borrowing costs could go up. If you're really worried about that, you can, you can play with duration in order to hedge that risk. The nature of this downturn over the last year has been so different, and the character of the snapback has been remarkably different to what we saw 10 years ago, Megan, and largely because of this discussion we're having right now. The willingness to do more on the fiscal side. Do you have the faith, Megan, that in this delicate moment we're in at the moment, with jobless claims moving in the wrong direction, that when things start to open up back again, when the vaccinations are really ramped up in a material way, that we can snap back just as quickly in the new year? Well, look, I think if you look at personal savings rates, which are still well above uh, historical averages, and if you look at the drop in discretionary spending among high-income people, that all suggests that there's quite a lot of pent-up demand that could be released if we hopefully get a vaccine widely distributed. So I do think that we'll have a pretty big kickback in terms of growth hopefully, uh, depending on the vaccine from the middle of next year onwards. I think the bigger question, though, is what happens after that pent-up demand is released? And then I think we're back to the long, hard slog. I think there will be scarring from this crisis. You're seeing it in the labor market in the U.S. with the number of permanent unemployed rising above the number of temporary unemployed. The number of long-term unemployed uh, has, has really skyrocketed in recent months. On top of which, you're having a lot of businesses reporting that actually they've been meaning to automate for a while and have taken this opportunity to go ahead and do that. So that suggests a lot of these jobs just aren't ever coming back. Um, and so I think that kind of scarring will be a longer term kind of drag on demand. And so we will get this kickback as pent up demand is released. But, but then I think it will be back to the long, hard slog.
Megan, thank you, as always, for everything. Megan Green there of the Harvard Kennedy School. Looking out again about this conversation around the snapback, what happens when we get there around the middle of 2021? And how will policymakers respond? I think there's a willingness from those that experienced the last 10 years not to have that premature declaration of victory all over again. Maybe the word that we heard yesterday from Fed Chair Jay Powell is one you'll hear repeatedly, transitory, transient. Get used to that. I imagine we'll hear it a lot more in the next 12 months. In the equity market right now, up 19 points for the S&P 500. At the market desk with your movers ahead of the opening bell, here's Katie Greifeld. Morning, John. Well, let's kick off with Roku. It's climbing pre-market after striking a deal with AT&T to carry HBO Max, really helping to cement Roku's position in that stay-at-home trade. Now, this could help expand HBO's reach as well, given that Roku has about 46 million subscribers versus 12.6 million subscribers for HBO Max. And moving on, Rite Aid is surging after a strong third quarter earnings showing, with revenue rising 12% from a year ago. Pharmacy services were really the engine behind that, with growth of over 29% last year. And the drugstore also boosted its full year forecast. And as you can see, that's boosting the stock as well. And Wish is also higher after a rocky trading debut. It fell over 16% yesterday in the worst performance for a large US IPO this year. And you can see that investors are buying the dip this morning, but Wish is still well below its IPO price of about $24. And finally, Marathon Patent is also having a big morning as that Bitcoin rally just continues to build. Shares of the crypto miner are up over 17%, and its pre-market turnover is higher than Amazon, Pfizer, and uh, wow. Microsoft as well. Demand for all things crypto just builds, John. Katie, thank you. We'll catch up with you around the opening bow. Thank you very much. Coming up, Fed Chair Jay Powell strengthening his commitment to supporting the U.S. economy. That conversation coming up next with Bank of America's Mark Cabana from New York and London this morning. Good morning. The opening bow, 20 minutes away. Futures up, a record high in sight. This is Bloomberg. weekly review of the most important business news analysis and interviews from Bloomberg Television around the world. Ken Burns, welcome to Bloomberg Big Decisions. We have always been a mixture of things. We are always stronger for that mixture. Growth is a way to stay competitive, delight more and more consumers. Are you worried that people won't take the vaccine? We remain uh, concerned about vaccine hesitancy. What is one word of advice you'll take with you? Learn how to listen. And that is certainly something that has served me well. Ankiti, where do you go from here? It's a huge market. It's a huge opportunity. I want to go 100x from here. Our philosophy is to partner where we can and stand apart when we should. We explore the trends, investments, and competition of the European ETF industry. Join us on Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe.
Chairman Powell delivered uh, pretty much on expectations. You know, so the least possible guidance the Fed could offer. The tone today was uh, very dovish. They're going to just be here for a lot longer. The near-term outlook here is very clear. Regarding asset purchases, maturities, what does the Fed do, and then how do they get out of it later on? They're going to continue at least at the current pace. There was a lot of dissonance, I think, at this meeting. Until we see substantial progress uh, in, um, uh, in their objectives. We're in for a much sort of hotter economic policy coming from the Fed. We really saw the Fed chairman be extremely uncomfortable talking about that. The primary policy agenda here is fiscal policy. This was the most uncomfortable I saw the Fed chairman. The Fed's in the in the back seat here. I have to say that was also the most uncomfortable I've seen him for quite a while as well. The Federal Reserve delivering on some expectations in its final meeting of the year, adding the finishing touches on guidance and maintaining its asset purchase program until seeing substantial progress. For more on that, let's bring in Bloomberg's international economics and policy correspondent, Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. Morning, John. Uh, you set me up so nicely. Ever had a hot take blown out <laughs> just by the data this morning? Uh, the jobless claims numbers, we got to mention, 885,000, up from 862. Philly Fed at 11.1, very weak, but the jobs sub-index is a disaster. Falls to 8.5 from 27.2. We knew that was going to happen, so you've got to expect this to be the kind of uh, morning that uh, the markets would sort of pull back? Nope. The very bright Kaylee line's telling us that uh, we are, uh, at this point, seeing people focused on 2021, and that's the story for the Fed, too. Jay Powell's points were that the QE they are using is an active management tool. They'll go up and down depending on how the economy goes. He is confirming, though, and the Fed did with their new statement, that rates will be lower for longer. They don't have to be this low because the economy may come back more quickly. And that's a real takeaway from the Fed that I think a lot of people haven't quite gotten. Uh, you look at their forecasting record. In June, they saw the economy looking really terrible for 2021, with unemployment at 9.3% in 2021, and uh, GDP falling uh, by 6.5%. Now, uh, today, they're looking at 4.2% growth, 5% unemployment, and core PCE at 1.8%. Uh, faster growth, lower unemployment, higher inflation. The market is buying into that. Not only equities rising, but you look at break-evens. Inflation over a five-year period now seen higher than it did uh, than it looked to people back in January and February. A stronger economy, rates aren't going to move much. Uh, more than a few analysts saying this morning, that is a buy signal. Michael McKee, many people saying the same thing. It's very powerful looking ahead to 2021. Their outlook was improving over the last couple of months. The forecast got a hike, and yet policy will stay the same. Bank of America's Mark Cabana expecting the Fed to remain supportive for the foreseeable future. He says the following, with no intention to stop actively easing until they're close to their mandate. Mark joins us now for more. Mark, let's talk about this. If they upgrade forecasts and leave policy the same, did the Fed just ease? I don't know. Uh, so they've been very accommodative, and we anticipate that they will remain that way for the foreseeable future. What they are trying to do is that they're trying to convince the market that they will allow the economy to run hot for a period of time and to run hot until they see inflation move sustainably higher. We thought that Chair Powell's comments yesterday on inflation were very, very telling about the forcibly dovish backdrop that this Fed is going to have. He was talking about psychological impacts that they're trying to influence to convince market participants and participants in the economy that inflation will indeed remain high or that, that it can increase over time. And so given the forecasts of an improving growth outlook, the Fed is still going to keep rates on hold, and they are going to remain very, very very dovish and very, very accommodative for quite a long time. Mark, I understand that's the message, but when the data comes in the middle of next year and starts to test the patience of this market, the market will get to define what substantial progress actually is. And I do wonder, Mark, based on the guidance they offered yesterday, whether there might be some issues in offering qualitative outcome-based guidance instead of something a little bit harder, firmer, or even time contingent guidance to really commit to this and say, whatever happens in 21, forget it about it. We're out of the game until 22. 
Yeah, so the qualitative guidance that they provided yesterday we thought was deliberately vague. They're trying to preserve as much flexibility as they can with regards to their asset purchases to be nimble around how the economic outlook evolves. But what I thought was very clear, what we thought was very clear yesterday, was this is the Fed that has no intention of tapering anytime soon. There's been a burgeoning market narrative out there that, oh, well, the Fed may have to take away the punch bowl at some point in 2021, or the Fed may need to start tapering at some point in 2021 because inflation is going to improve and the data is going to be better. This is a Fed that right now is very content to push back on that narrative. Now, you're right, the data may change, but what we know is that going into that period, this is a Fed that is indicating that it's going to allow the economy to run hot. And look, the Fed's guidance on their flexible average inflation targeting regime, or FATE, will be tested at some point next year. But given how Chair Powell sounded yesterday, it certainly seems like they're moving into 2021 with a lot of resolve to push back on the market if it tries to believe that the Fed is going to be overly aggressive and begin tightening earlier than maybe they envision right now. The Fed is going to remain Mark, easy based on everything we've heard. I agree. The statement was really powerful and the projections were really powerful as well. Looking ahead to next year, Mark, I just wonder what your calls are at the moment as to what they might do, because we had a conversation for the last month or so that they might be extending the average maturity of the asset purchase program, and then it didn't happen. Then there was some vague comment about maybe they could do that at some point in the future. Mark, do you have an understanding as to what would prompt that move? So we did not think that they would extend the weighted average maturity of their purchases, primarily because we didn't think that they had seen enough evidence yet that the economy had slowed. Now, look, I know what the claims data is doing. It's it's moving in the wrong direction. But I still don't think that the Fed has yet seen enough to justify it. Also, importantly, they look at financial conditions very, very closely. Financial conditions are extraordinarily easy. And there is no reason for the Fed to take another easing measure when you've got equities at or near all-time highs, mortgage rates rates at or near all-time lows, credit tight and flowing. So we didn't think that they would take that action. But what they did say is that they're preserving flexibility, they're willing to do more if they need to, but they hope that they will not have to do that. Now, what does this mean for 2021 and the outlook for those asset purchases? Well, we think that they will maintain the current pace of asset purchases for the duration of 2021 and not think about uh, not think about tapering until early in 2022, or at least start tapering until early in 2022. So again, this is going to be lots of additional asset purchases, lots of additional reserves provided to the banking system, and that is going to help reinforce this very, very dovish message, even in the face of improving economic data, which we think we'll start to see clear evidence of around the second quarter of next year. Mark, just a final question for me on the yield curve then. Do you get the sense that they would be uncomfortable with a steeper curve? I didn't hear that in the news conference yesterday. What's your takeaway on that? No, we don't think that they're going to be uncomfortable by a steeper yield curve in and of itself. And other Fed officials have told us that they've been unconcerned by some of the recent increase in longer dated interest rates that we have seen. Uh, Vice Chair Clarida made that very clear a few weeks ago. Instead, what we think the Fed will be looking at is not just the level of long end yields or the shape of the curve, but what is driving rates higher? What's driving any type of steepening of the curve? And if it's due to, quote unquote, healthy factors, i.e. better economic data, progress on the vaccine, uh, higher inflation expectations, the Fed will embrace that. And that's the type of rate rise that we've seen over the last month or so. And that's the type of rate rise that we anticipate going forward into 2021 as well. However, if the Fed sees signs that it's an unhealthy rate rise, a rate rise driven by too much Treasury supply or a policy error or something along those lines. The Fed will fight against that. That's when they think that we think that they could extend their weighted average maturity, or that's when we think that they could increase the pace. So a lot depends on the composition. But if you look within the market, just as you and Michael were talking about a few moments ago, what's driving rates recently? It's break-evens. Break-evens are widening. They're back towards yep. levels that we saw pre-COVID. And that is exactly what the Fed wants to see. That's the type of policy that they're trying to drive in financial markets and that they hope will begin to influence longer-dated inflation expectations. So what they're doing so far appears to be working. We anticipate that the Fed will stick to their guns and reinforce this policy even as the data turns. So that means rising rates, but rising rates for healthy or good reasons. Mark, always strong and always great to catch up. Mark Abana there of Bank of America. Real yields lower, deeply negative, inflation expectations higher, and nominals really stable. There's a lot of action 
beneath the surface and above the surface around what's happening with Treasuries at the moment. Coming up, the Amherst action. You need to know. That'll be next in our morning calls. Then later, around the opening bow, Jonathan Golliver, Credit Suisse, weighing in on the cyclical rotation, gripping markets, and we'll get his thoughts on what's happening in this FX market at the moment and what this weaker dollar means for your equity market. All coming up, this is Bloomberg. I think what we've seen during this period of time is that communicating via video is not a fad. That we are using it in all aspects of our lives for work, for learning, for communicating, for staying in touch. Five minutes away from the cash open, a record high, very much in sight on the radar around the opening bow in a stormy New York City. Equity futures up 17 points on the S&P. We advance a half of 1%. Let's get you some morning calls. Morgan Stanley downgrading AT&T to equal weight, a $34 price target. The analyst expecting consumers to increasingly purchase their smartphones from Apple next year due to a robust 5G upgrade cycle. We're down about a half of 1% there. Next up, Wells Fargo upgrading young brands to overweight, a 125 price target. The analyst expecting restaurant chains to benefit from pent-up demand of consumers with money to spend. We're up about 1% there. Going into the open, your final call from Citigroup, Dan Grenning, United Rentals to neutral, a 255 price target. The analyst seeing limited room for additional upside following the stock's most recent rally. We're down there by six-tenths of 1%. Up next, Wall Street warming up to energy with cyclicals gaining momentum. That conversation coming up with Jonathan Golub of Credit Suisse. With your equity market improving, your equity market heading for a record high. This is Bloomberg.
goes into this plant, it's heated up very quickly to 600 or so degrees. It basically carbonizes. Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is a market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. It's a real Friday feel to this market. I understand it's Thursday, and maybe it's me wishing away the week, the month, the rest of the year. Maybe I want to live in the back half of 2021 with this equity market at all-time highs where things are great, we're all vaccinated and living a normal life again. That would be nice. There's your opening bell. Futures up 18 on the S&P. We are nicely through 3,700. Switch up the board into the bond market we go. Treasury yields really, really well behaved. On a 10-year at the moment, yields come in a basis point or two, sub-90 briefly, off the back of some disappointing data in the labour market once again. That's the story in the bond market. Foreign exchange, euro dollar, 122.45, up four-tenths of 1%. The dollar index, the weakest we've seen it, the lowest we've seen it since April 2018. Do you remember the happy talk of synchronized global growth in 2017? This is where the dollar bottomed out in spring 2018, before things got a little bit more interesting around all things China. That's the setup. Got into the open. Record highs very much on the cards. Let's get to the market desk and get your movers. Back with us, here's Katie. Hi, John. Well, Novavax opened about 3% higher after it completed early talks with the European Commission to potentially supply up to 200 million doses of its COVID-19 vaccine. This comes amid questions over AstraZeneca's data and as GlaxoSmithKline's vaccine faces delays. Now, also on the vaccine front, Moderna is up slightly higher ahead of an expected decision from the FDA's advisory panel. Now, FDA approval could come tomorrow if the timeline is similar to Pfizer's approval last week. And let's check in on Roku again. Shares are up almost 6%, about 6%, after signing a deal to carry HBO Max, which is also good news for HBO as it focuses on a strategy for continued lockdowns. And finally, Rite Aid is surging, up almost 23% after a big beat on third quarter revenue. It upgraded its full year forecast as well with the low end, still above analyst forecasts, so that growth may continue into 2021, John. Katie, thank you. Let's get to these record highs, shall we? About two minutes into the session, call it a minute and about 45 seconds. Your equity market up about a half of 1% on the S&P, on the NASDAQ, a record high on the NASDAQ, a record high on the S&P 500. Your new all-time high, the S&P, 3722.71. This equity market really rallying off the back of vaccine rollout optimism surrounding the recovery, fueling a big rally in the cyclicals. City's Kristen Bidley seeing more room to run. The minute that we heard about this Pfizer vaccine, we saw one of those violent rotations into value, into the COVID cyclical um, stocks, as we call them. But the truth of the matter is there's still a lot of room left to run. The key thing is actually finding these pockets that once we are in a post-COVID world, you want to have some of your exposure in your portfolio today and not wait until it's too late. 
Let's get back to the market desk and catch up with Bloomberg's Kelly Lines. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Well, this rotation has been furious over the last six weeks or so. The leaders in the market losing steam and instead the laggards picking up the mantle. If you just take a look at the performance of the NASDAQ 100 over the past two months, of course, it holds the largest of large cap tech and the S&P 500, which to a large extent is also beholden to big tech. They're each up about 6%. The small cap Russell 2000, on the other hand, which of course is more economically sensitive, domestically oriented that recovery trade, that index is up more than 20%. The margin of outperformance is really staggering. That's it on the index level. And when you take a look at the sector level as well, it is the cyclicals that have led the way. From November 9th, when Pfizer first gave a positive vaccine news until yesterday's close, the two best performing sectors in the S&P 500 were energy and financials. Energy up more than 30% over the past two months, financials by 14%. But while they are impressive rallies, they're still down 34% and 7% respectively on the year. So that is that room to run that she, you just heard Kristen bitterly talking about. That is the thesis here is that there is more upside to come. And when it comes to earnings expectations going forward next year, their profit is seen jumping 46% for value stocks. That is more than double what growth stocks are expected to post. And finally, John. I just want to point out that while this dynamic is certainly remarkable, the fact that cyclicals value areas of the market are doing so well right now, that's pretty odd in recessions. Back in 2008, it was defensives that were outperforming cyclicals. Now we are seeing the opposite happen. It just goes to show you how unusual this recession is and how the market is basically already living in a recovered world, John. An incredibly unusual year all round. Caddy Lights, thank you very much. Jonathan Golub of Credit Suisse looking for value with stocks hovering at record highs, saying the following. All 11 S&P sectors are trading above their 10-year averages, but on a relative basis, there's opportunities in several sectors with the financials and healthcare appearing extremely undervalued. Jonathan joins us now for more. John, just going back over your research over the last month or so, you asked, I think, the most important question and others were asked